So welcome everyone at this webinar organized by the World Duchenne Organization on gene therapy in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. My name is Susie Ann Baker. I will be your host for today. And together with Elizabeth, we have pulled together uh, quite a good program to learn all the ins and outs about gene therapy in Duchenne. So just a brief overview of what we're going to talk about today. We will start with a welcome by the chair of the World Duchenne Organization, Elisabeth Brom. Then we will move on to Professor Annemieke Aarsmeurus to get an oversight of how gene therapy works. Before moving on to certain clinical aspects on gene therapy, here we have Professor Mercuri, Professor Montoni and Dr. Chet Villa. Then we hop on to a short break before moving on to really getting a big overview of the gene therapy landscape with various presentations. And last but not least, we want to learn from the SMA experience when, it, when it's all about reimbursement and access. So with nothing further ado, I'd like to hand over the talking stick to Elizabeth for the official welcome. Thank you, Susie, and also thank you for setting this up. We know it always looks so easy, but you do a lot of work to organize all these wonderful webinars. Well, today in 2023, we speak about gene therapy for Duchenne, and it has been a long road. The majority of you might not know, but I see uh, Dr. Serge Brown here in 97, I believe. We had meetings at the AFM, who always has been um, a leader in this field at the beginning already, um, about gene therapy for Duchenne. And we've seen a lot of hurdles, bottlenecks, barriers, but a lot has overcome. And today is the day that we hear where we stand now and what we know today, but also about what we don't know yet because i'm sure there will be will come more but we're very happy everybody's here thank you to the speakers speakers from science speakers from uh, the clinic uh, from the companies and um maybe it's good to say this webinar is not sponsored it's just a wdo uh, webinar and we really would like to um introduce the or i would like to introduce the first speaker you might know professor annemika artsma rus She's very well known, not only for her work, but above all, well known by patients and patient organizations for being a good uh, translator into lay language of difficult um, scientific um, uh, scientific stories, papers, whatever she translated. She's translating it for the lay uh, people. And I hope also here you can do a fantastic job in translating gene therapy in in language, which is understandable for everybody who's in the call. So um, the microphone is yours, uh, Annemiek. And I, we have to say a disclaimer, every now and then there's a blur in your uh, <laughs> network, right? So if she's, there, gone, yeah. she's not gone, she comes back. She always I, comes yeah. back. Yeah. I, I already disconnected once, but I was fortunately back on time. So uh, mm -hmm. welcome and thanks to the World Duchenne Organization for, for allowing me to, to introduce uh, gene therapy and the basics and to, to give some sort of state-of-the-art overview um, so we'll start with my disclosures and I'll, I'll just give you the summary. So for this, um, for this presentation, what's important to know is that, um, some of the companies that are speaking here, I consult for them, or I'm on their advisory board, or I spoke at, at, at satellite symposiums that they organized. However, the money that they paid for this didn't go into my pocket, but, um, it went to my employer LUMC. So going into the nitty gritty of gene therapy. So we have genes and genes contain the code for proteins and proteins have all sorts of functions in our tissues, in our, in, in our organs. And um, so this is important. So the genes, they are made up, uh, made up out of DNA and they're stored on our chromosomes. So each cell has a set of chromosomes, contains our 23,000 genes that all encode for different proteins. So that is, say, the, the, the basis of DNA. DNA contains the code for the protein. Now, what can happen is that a mutation or a pathogenic variant, if you will, occurs on a certain gene. You can see here, there is a, a, a mutation occurring here on this X chromosome. And then that's a mutation in DNA. And that will mean that protein uh, 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 cannot be produced. And there is, of course, a reason that I chose the X chromosome because the dystrophin gene is located on the X chromosome. Um, and this is what's, what's, what's wrong with Duchenne patients. There's a mutation in the dystrophin gene, and therefore Duchenne patients cannot make the dystrophin protein. 
So what does dystrophin do? In skeletal muscle, dystrophin stabilizes the muscle fiber during contraction. And it does this by connecting the, uh, the, the skeleton of the muscle fiber to the layer of connective tissue surrounding the muscle fiber. And we're going to discuss today only dystrophin in skeletal muscle and heart. But bear in mind that dystrophin has also other functions in other tissues. And there's different dystrophin forms, for instance, in the brain. We're not talking about that today, but it's, it's good to bear this in mind. In muscle, if there is no dystrophin, um, the stabilization is, 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 is gone and there's continuous muscle damage. And I like to use the example of the carabiner um, for, for, to explain what dystrophin does because it has two crucial domains, just like dystrophin. So you connect to the, the, the skeleton of the muscle fiber and the connective tissue. And also you don't need dystrophin to have muscle. You don't need dystrophin to use muscle but you need dystrophin to prevent damage. Just like you need the carabiner if you go rock climbing, you don't need it to go rock climbing, but you're very happy you have it um, when you make a mistake. In Duchenne patients, only the beginning of the protein can be made, so this linker to the connective tissue is lost. And as you probably all are all aware, Becker patients make a shorter dystrophin that has both these crucial domains, but the connecting part is shorter. Now, if there is no dystrophin, this leads to chronic inflammation, scar tissue formation, so muscle is replaced by fibrosis and adipose tissue, the regeneration is repaired, and this leads to continuous loss of muscle tissue and muscle function that you are all familiar with. So, scene addition works on the premise that, well, if you cannot make dystrophin because your dystrophin gene is not working, can we provide a gene copy of the dystrophin gene in this case to patients, and then with that copy, the cells can make dystrophin. And I like to call this gene addition. Some people call it gene replacement, that, but that's not really what's, what, what we're doing. But to come back to our chromosomes, we have here our X chromosome. This is where the dystrophin gene is located. What we're not doing with gene therapy is editing this issue. So cutting out what is wrong and replacing it with something that's right. What we do is we add an extra gene, what we call a transgene, and in this case, this is the dystrophin gene. Now, this dystrophin gene needs to go to multiple cells, and it needs to go to the muscle cells and to the heart cells. It's not enough if it goes into one cell. It's not enough if it goes into a few cells in one muscle. It really needs to go to the majority of cells to allow good dystrophin production. So a challenge for muscle is that muscle is very abundant. So 30 to 40% of our body weight is muscle. So that's a lot. And also muscle is not a single organ. We have over 700 different skeletal muscle and they're almost all affected in Duchenne. So it's not enough if we treat one muscle or a few muscles, we really want to treat the majority. And then once the muscle is replaced by fat and fibrosis, it appears that it's irreversible in humans. So once a function is lost, it cannot be recovered. So the time of intervention matters. And I don't say that you therefore shouldn't treat older patients uh, once they've lost a certain function, but I do say that the earlier you treat, likely the, the more functions you can, um, you can rescue. Um, so we need to deliver these genes uh, to uh, the muscle. So what do we uh, what do we need? We need a vector. We need a tool. We need a delivery vehicle. Now, viral vectors are very good at delivering genetic information to cells. Um, however, most viral vectors, most viruses, don't like to infect non-dividing cells, so it's such muscles. However, adeno-associated virus AAV can infect muscles and also motor neurons, and we'll, we'll hear about the SMA story later. It's small, so that means only small genes fit, and we'll come back to that. But to make your, your viral vector what you need, you need some viral sequences in the DNA because your DNA needs to go into the, into the virus shell that, that caps it. You need a promoter so that it's turned on in skeletal muscle in this case, and then you need the gene code for your, your transgene. And just something more about AAV first, because we say it can go to muscle. And you see here, there's different serotypes, so there's different flavors of AV. And I think we're now more familiar with these different flavors because of the pandemic. We know there's the Omicron, we know there's the Delta variant. Well, AAV also has different variants, but they have numbers rather than Greek letters. 
So there are certain AAVs that can go to muscle reasonably well. Um, and I think especially 7, 8, and 9, and 7, 4, the one that, that Sarepta and Rose are using, they will go to muscle. However, they don't go exclusively to muscle. They go also very efficiently to liver. And you see here that most AAVs go to liver, but also the ones that are used to reach the muscle. So when we say they can infect muscle, um, what we don't mean is that they do it exclusively. A high amount will end up in liver. And that's something to consider because AAV normally is not pathogenic. So you can have an AAV infection, you don't know it, you don't get sick from it. However, if we want to use AAV to treat muscle diseases, we need a very high dose because you have that much muscle. Um, and this can cause severe side effects. Um, even though if you have a few viruses during an infection, you don't get sick, we're now using astronomical amounts of viruses and that causes side effects. And also there you use a high, very high dose, the liver gets really a lot of viral particles per cells and that also leads to problems. And you'll hear more about that uh, later today. Um, so an immune response to the virus will occur even if you in, in, uh, suppress the immune system. Um, and again, the, the immune system, its job is to respond to viruses and bacteria. It doesn't realize that this virus now carries a gene that, 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 that's useful. It just recognizes the virus and thinks this is something that I need to, uh, need to attack and destroy. Um, of course, because the immune system has a memory, if you have been ex exposed as an individual to a certain AAV serotype before, you cannot be treated with that serotype because the immune uh, response will be, be, will be too high. And this is why if you're participating in a clinical trial or if you uh, want to be treated with gene therapy, there's an antibody test done to see whether you have been exposed before to AAV 7, 4, 9, 8, etc. So now back to dextrophin. So we need our AAV system because that's the only, only tool that can deliver to, to, to muscle. Um, we need to ex uh, make sure that people have not had exposure to it in the past. But I mentioned already, AAV is small. So only small genes fit. And as it happens, the dystrophin gene is one of the largest genes that we have. So the gene or the, the protein code is too big, it doesn't fit. So we need to make it shorter and we still need these, these crucial elements. We need the promoter, the volume switch to, to make sure it's expressed only in muscle. We need some viral sequences to make sure it goes into the particles. Um, and that means that there's not that much space left for the, for the dystrophin gene code. And that means that, that we as a field had to become creative and make microdystrophins. And they are about 30 to 35% of the full length dystrophin. So they're really, a lot shorter than the full length dystrophin, the normal dystrophin, and they're also shorter than the Becker dystrophins that, that, that we see in patients. So just bear this in mind, it's really much smaller than full length, and it's also smaller than what, what's been, been used in, in, in Becker patients, or what we see in Becker patients. Then of course the question is, if it's that small, is it functional? Well, it's been tested in mouse models and dog models, and there we see that there's a therapeutic effect. So the disease, the pathology was delayed in mouse and dog models for Duchenne. Then I'm also going to summarize almost a decade of work, if not more, Elizabeth already mentioned that what we, we spoke about gene therapies in, 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 before the, the, say in the previous millennium. It took a long time to, to optimize things. And once it was clear that well, this, this works in, in, in mice, there were problems of upscaling, so we had to upscale. Production had to become feasible at large scale, at clinical grade. We had to do body-wide delivery, which was problematic for a long time, but we know now that it's possible. And we had to suppress the immune response with steroids and also do the pre-screening um, to filter out those individuals who had already encountered AAV before. So what do these microdystrophins look like? And I have here an overview of the different ones. So Sarepta and Roche, they collaborate, so they, they use the same one. Geneton uses the same microdystrophin, but a different AAV, as you can see. Then Pfizer has a slightly different microdystrophin. Solid has, again, a slightly different uh, microdystrophin. And Regenex Bio has, again, a different microdystrophin. And what you can see, they all have this. The X 
second binding domain, that's the, the first clicker domain connecting to the skeleton of the muscle fiber. They all have this part, the cis. That's the second clicker domain connecting to the um, connective tissue. And then there's some variability, so there's some variation in which parts of the, the central domain of the dystrophin is in there. But what you can see, there's more similarities than differences. You can, of course, ask which is the best one. And well, I, I'm going to predict that each of the companies that uses a specific one is going to say that theirs is, of course, the best one. I want to stress there's more similarities than differences between them. So these compounds have been tested and are being tested in clinical trials. And I'm just going to give you a, a, a brief overview. There will be more detail from the companies later, but just so you have the, the, the complete pictures. So there's phase three clinical trials already ongoing for the Sarepta Roche uh, compound, for uh, the Pfizer compound, um, uh, and, and, and earlier stage uh, trials have been completed or still ongoing. And then uh, for, for solid uh, Geneton and, and Regenex Bio, um, only early stage uh, trials have been, have been done. And as I'm sure you know, the, the Sarepta gene therapy, the Elephidus, has been approved by the FDA for four to five-year-olds, and I'll, I'll put that into context later as well. First, just some general findings from what we've seen in the now almost 200 patients that have been treated. They were all screened, so patients were negative for whatever AAV serotype was used, so AAV 9, 7, 4, or 8. Um, and there are some, just some, some general findings that we see. What we see is if you use AAV gene therapy, you can restore microdystrophin in skeletal muscle. And I think if you're, if you're just new in the field, you will not appreciate what it means to say that because five years ago, 10 years ago, we did not think that this was feasible. But we know now it is feasible. You inject the AAVs intravenously and they will go to the muscles and, um, and, and, and deliver their, their microdystrophin. What we also see is that there's variability in how much microdystrophin is, is produced. So for some patients, it's 5% of muscle fibers at 1% of total. And in some patients, it's 80% at more than 70% of total. There's variability. Um, and this is related to the dose. However, what we also know that there's side effects, and these can, these can be severe to very severe. So far, two patients have died, uh, one in a, in a Pfizer trial, and the other one, um, he did not get the microdystrophin gene therapy. He got genome editing components, but he didn't die due to the genome editing. He died due to an immune response, an acute immune response to the AAV. So they were all, uh, both older patients, but this does stress that these side effects um, should not be trivialized. They are related to the dose. So the higher the dose, the more at risk you are to get these very severe side effects. However, the microdystrophin doses uh, levels are also related to the dose. You can say, well, let's use a lower dose, but then you have 5% of fibers expressing 1% of dystrophin, where we really think, well, will that have a functional effect? So you want a higher dose, but that's also the dose that, that, that puts you at risk for the severe side effect. We also see that the side effects are age related. So the older you are, the heavier you are. So the more viruses you get, so the more at risk you are for the side effects. And also if you're older, you have a more mature immune system. So these side effects, the ones that I just mentioned are acute. So there's nausea, liver damage, kidney failure, sepsis, death. Um, it's, it's not trivial. These are, are, are severe things. But there's also a side effect that occurs later. And I know that, that Professor Francesco Mutoni will present about this in more detail later. So I'll, I'll go over it briefly. Um, so the later side effect is an immune response against the muscle and the heart, against the microdystrophin. And we only see it in certain patients who have a deletion at the beginning of the gene. Now, how, how, is that, how does that work? What we think is what well, we know that the immune system reacts to proteins that are foreign, that are not self. And I just said, Duchenne patients don't make dystrophin at the beginning of this talk, but that's not really true. So if Duchenne patients didn't make dystrophin, you would expect that everyone who started to produce microdystrophin would have an immune response against the microdystrophin. That is not what we see. And that is because many individuals can still produce a smaller dystrophin. So I mentioned there's dystrophin in the brain, and that is just this last bit. That is part of the microdystrophin. 
So that part is not new to more than 99% of patients and to all patients who are treated with gene therapy. Now, the beginning of the microdystrophin, this first clicker domain, that is present in most patients as well, because the mutation that most patients have is located here in the middle. So they can make the beginning part, it's not stable, but the immune system will be familiar with it. They will have seen it. Now, patients who have a deletion in this area, about 10% of cases, for them, this part will be new because they've never produced it. And now suddenly they get a microdystrophin that contains this part of the protein that they've never seen. And the immune system can be triggered by this and then start to break down the muscles and the heart that produces the microdystrophin. And that is, of course, not a good thing. So patients with these deletions are currently being excluded from the trials and treatment. So a brief summary of the different uh, uh, trials. Um, so I mentioned already, Pfizer has done early stage studies um, you, comparing a low dose and a high dose. They saw most uh, dystrophin restoration at the higher dose. They also saw severe side effects, as I mentioned already. And currently there's uh, placebo control trials um, uh, ongoing um, uh, in uh, ambulant patients. There's also a study in both non-ambulant and ambulant patients. And this is the, the, the study where one of the patients has died and then the trial was put on partial or on temporary hold. Um, so you will hear more from, from Pfizer, but just knowing that these, these trials are ongoing and there's a placebo control trial. So for uh, Geneton, the first patient was dosed in 2021. And I understood from Professor uh, Montoni that there's currently five patients dosed, but there's no results uh, published yet or reported yet. Regenex Bio has dosed their first patients in January 23, so this year, and their first result of the first three patients are, are in. It was well tolerated. They see 40% microdystrophin in, in one patient, and they're preparing for dose escalation. And again, more will, pre will be presented later. Um, Solid had a, had a, a, a rough uh, start with their trials because the first patient they dosed immediately had one of those severe side effects. Um, was a temporary hold that was uh, uh, started again. Additional patients were were, were dosed, and but well, the dystrophin levels were were not that, that high. Um, it was put on hold again after a, a, a severe side effect. But then afterwards, uh, uh, additional patients were treated without severe side effects, and uh, Solid will uh, present on their, their their next step in their presentation. But just to outline to you that. These things are not easy, and these side effects are, are not trivial. Now for Elevadis. Um, so this is the Sarepta Roche microdystrophin that was approved by the FDA. But there are some buts. First of all, it's approved only for four to five years old um, without this deletion at the beginning of the gene. The approval is only based on microdystrophin uh, restoration. There's no evidence of functional efficacy according to the FDA. And I'll go over the trials, and I made this slide before the Embark results came in, but of course I, I updated it last week when the Embark results came in. But I'll, I'll just start very briefly with two trials that didn't have a placebo group. So four patients were treated at the very early stage, had really good microdystrophin levels, and then um, there was a, a, an open-label study with 20 patients treated with commercial products, also had over 50% microdystrophin levels. And, and there's a part two of this trial, but there's no results from that yet. And there were no uh, placebo groups in this. There is a placebo controlled trial with results with 41 patients that will go over the results. And of course, the Embark results are in as well. Now, why is it important to stress the, the, the lack of placebo? Um, and you can't draw a conclusion. And that is because, well, if you treat the patients um, and there's no compar comparison group, you can say, well, but we have the baseline and then we follow the patients and we see whether they improve functionally. However, the patients who are treated in these gene therapy trials, they're young. They're usually in the four to seven years age range. And we know that these patients treat, improve anyway, even if they're not treated. So that makes this comparison to baseline very difficult. You can say, let's compare them to natural history, what we, what we know from, from other untreated patients, but also that is difficult because the patients who are treated have a more rigorous steroid regime, and we know that will also have an impact on, on function. So data outside of the placebo is, is, is really, the functional data is really difficult to interpret. So we need the placebo-controlled uh, data. Now, before last week, we had um, one data set from, from Sarepta Roche, 
Um, and that was a study where 20 patients were treated and 21 patients were, were treated after a year. So for one year, we had a group that was treated and a group that had the placebo. And, and it was double blind. After one year, there was no difference seen in the North Star ambulatory assessment functional scale between treated and untreated. Um, there was subgroup analysis done, but then of course you get really small groups um, because already 20 is not, not that large of a group. And well, as, as you know, this uh, Duchenne is, is quite uh, uh, heterogeneous. So there was no way to, to, to well, at least FDA didn't accept those, these results. Um, so then you can say, well, if there wasn't a difference after one year, can we then conclude that this is not slowing down disease progression? No, because the 20 patients who were treated at baseline, so at the beginning, they had very low microdystrophin levels, about um, 20%. And I showed you in the slide before, usually it's more. Um, and then if you look in the, in the publication, what you will see is that 12 patients, due to an, 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 an error in, in, in establishing how much a, a virus there was, they received too little. And well, if they received too little, that can explain why they didn't make as much microdystrophin as, as the other patients, but it can also explain why maybe they didn't respond. So the bottom line is from this trial, we cannot conclude whether it works or not. So we needed the EMBARC study. Well, it would have been great if the EMBARC study had met its primary endpoint. However, sadly, it did not. So EMBARC had 127, uh, sorry, 124 patients, half were treated, they were followed for, for 52 weeks or so one year. And then after one year, both patients, uh, both groups increased. As I said already, in this young age, you expect patients to increase in the North Star assessment. However, the treated group increased more. So 0 0.65 points difference. This difference was not significant. And this is why the primary endpoint was not met. There were differences uh, that were significant in uh, secondary endpoints. So the time to rise from the floor, the 10 meter walk run, there were improvements seen in other secondary endpoints, but these were not significant. There were no new safety data, but as I mentioned already, there are side effects. So the, there's the, the nausea, the vomiting, fever, liver injury, et cetera, that we mentioned already earlier and severe adverse events were seen in 11% of treated patients. So just to put that in perspective. The data is currently with FDA and well, I, I cannot predict what FDA will do. As I said, it would have been easy if the, the primary endpoint was met, it was not. So um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see uh, what, um, what FDA has to say about this. Some considerations at the end, um, and that's just a warning, not all patients will respond equally well. If you go on social media, there is a strong bias to the really good responders. In publications, what you see is that there's also patients that recline, decline, that don't respond as well. So just bear that in mind. Um, of course, it would be great if everyone responded as well as these good responders, but that is not the, 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 the whole truth. Also, the severe side effects, I mentioned them already. Um, mostly shortly after the treatment and older patients are more at risk and, and just don't trivialize, don't underestimate these side effects, especially for the older patients because already they have respiratory and heart problems and therefore less of a buffer to cope with the side effects. Um, then also something about a one-time treatment because microdystrophin treatment is a one-time treatment and that is not because we think the effect will be permanent but because the immunity prevents retreatment. Why don't we think the effects are permanent? Because the microdystrophins are not fully functional. They're partially functional. So with time, the, the muscle will, be, will still be damaged. The microdystrophin proteins will be, will be lost. Um, and then with time, you will lose the amount of microdystrophin that you have. What we don't know is how long this will take. Will it take years? Will it take decades? Um, that's what we don't know, but we do know that this will not stay there permanently. And if patients have 50% now, then in, 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 in a couple of years, likely they will have less than 50%. So that is the, again, another sad reality. So in summary, the microdystrophin AEV gene therapy results in microdystrophin expression in skeletal muscle. And again, don't underestimate what an achievement it is. This is something that people have worked for decades on. Um, it's associated with side effects, especially in the older patients. 
There's currently no evidence that microdystrophin expression slows down disease progression, trials are ongoing, and it's not a one and done treatment as some other gene therapies are because the microdystrophin is not fully functional and with time you will lose it. And that was my last slide, so I'll stop sharing and um, give the, the, the floor back to Elizabeth. Thank you, Annemiek, for your um, impressive presentation again. We will do, for the people who already typed questions, we will do this later. So the next speaker is uh, pre-recorded as last minute he had another obligation to fulfill today. And it is um, Professor Eugenio Mercuri. He's a professor of pediatric neurology at a Catholic university in Rome, Gemelli Hospital. And he will speak about managing serious adverse events. Good evening. I'm going to record this, uh, and uh, but I will be available for uh, the general discussion later. I will discuss uh, managing serious adverse events uh, following gene therapy. We know that uh, gene therapy, as uh, all the other therapies, uh, always take uh, in consideration what is the bene benefit risk profile. And uh, we know that uh, in, uh, in several neuromuscular disorders, now gene therapy has been used and that different gene therapy strategies help to address the root cause of the disease with uh, preliminary results, both in SMA, but now also in Duchenne, which are extremely promising. Uh, on the other hand, the one-off gene therapies is uh, also associated to potential risk uh, or to risk that have been shown uh, both in preclinical studies or in clinical trials or when available in real world data. And we know there are some treatment related risks uh, which are more obvious uh, um, in, in terms of immune response to the transgene or to the vector. And uh, serious adverse events are always a major concern. And uh, we know from the previous experience with gene therapy, not only in Duchenne, but also in other neuromuscular disorders, that there are some potential serious adverse events uh, that can occur at different times after dosing. And this is a sort of general scheme of the safety considerations following uh, uh, AAV-based gene therapy administration. And uh, uh, this, uh, scheme shows how we can have uh, different events uh, that are related to different mechanisms at different times after dosing. Uh, uh, just in a nutshell, we know there are some events which are, which are more common uh, soon after the infusion, in the first few days or the first week after infusion, mainly nose and vomiting, but also others. There are other um, um, adverse events that are uh, probably immune uh, response, uh, especially uh, against the, the viral capsid uh, that cause complement activation, and uh, that are more obvious in the first two weeks. Uh, and then we have uh, some other uh, adverse events which becomes more obvious a bit later, by the end of the first month, or let's say the first three months, uh, which are uh, immune response against the, the, the viral capsid, but also later after between one and three months, also against the transgene protein, uh, the transgene protein. and these are different uh, uh, in nature and also in, in terms of severity. When we talk about management of serious adverse events, what we really talk is, however, is can we prevent uh, po the possible serious adverse events? Uh, and uh, I will go through today what uh, we have learned from uh, our clinical trials and from the use of some of, of these gene therapies in, uh, in, in real world uh, on uh, how we can be ready at the time when we are starting gene therapy in a patient, starting from the pre-dosing, um, paying attention to the intraoperative at the time of dosing, but also on what we do as part of the post-dosing. One important thing is really to prepare the center before we even considering entering in, into a gene therapy trial or into a real world program. We know there are some things that the center have to be ready about the uh, product pathway, about the patient pathway in the hospital, and there are a lot of procedures that have to be in place about safety, both safety of the product and safety of the patients and of the clinical um, and the preparation of the clinical area for infusion and the post-procedure monitoring that have to be taken into account. 
Today, however, I will concentrate on the preparation of the center for possible serious adverse events. And uh, the key word is really to have a training of uh, uh, the members of the staff, uh, not only of the ones who are involved in the, uh, in the delivery of the treatment, but uh, even more importantly, to a larger multidisciplinary team uh, um, so that uh, they can be uh, informed and they can be rapidly accessed when we need advice or consultation, especially in the events of a serious adverse event. Uh, and uh, of course, we also have to make sure that there is access to age appropriate clinical facilities for the post treatment observation period. And uh, so what is important? It's important at the time when a center, um, that, or, or in terms of family, that when you consider being treated in, in a center, that uh, you make sure that uh, the center has some procedure in place, because we know from uh, other experience with gene therapy becoming available for other disorders like SMA, that a lot of centers have been found uh, um, to be eligible for treatment, even if they didn't have a previous experience with gene therapy and no specific requirements uh, uh, were in place. So it's very important that the centers who perform gene therapy have uh, some procedures in place that the, the key uh, involved staff is identified and trained very carefully. And it's very important that there are some standard operating procedures, some protocols, some specific records that are already in place and uh, that everything follows uh, uh, standard oper operating procedures. And we will see in details uh, both in patient preparation and also in the follow-up. And uh, I think the, the centers who have already some experience in clinical trial, whether there were stricter criteria or who have experience from previous real world evidence, of course, uh, have uh, more experience and have more expertise in how this should be dealt. So it's very important that the training involves the people in the pharmacy, the people in the hospital who are the other consultants. We will see in a moment how many have to be involved, but also the people on the intensive care. And when we talk about training is uh, that these people should be made aware that uh, a process of gene therapy is starting. They should know what is the gene therapy. They should know what is the disease. They, they should know something about the patients and they should know what are the expected or the possible uh, adverse events which are related to the, to the drug or to the specific drug, including uh, all the ones uh, who have become obvious from preclinical studies, the, the ones who have become obvious in clinical trials, or as we have seen in SMA, sometimes there were uh, adverse events that had not been uh, uh, part of the preclinical studies or of, and they were never observed in the clinical trials that became obvious in a, in a small minority of cases uh, uh, when uh, the drug was uh, commercially available and more widely used uh, in a much larger uh, number of, of people compared to the clinical trials. So um, all, the, all the study teams should receive training, should know about what is possibly uh, uh, happening even if, if this is uh, adverse, serious adverse events are relatively rare. And uh, this process should be followed uh, in the, irrespective of whether this is a clinical research setting or it's a real world setting. And the multidisciplinary team really should involve uh, all the team that are normally involved in the, uh, in the multidisciplinary team um, uh, with, with standards of care for the, for the patients, uh, but uh, the, they need extra training uh, for understanding, especially if there are some organs which are more likely to be affected. I mean, if we think of the gene therapy we had so far, uh, we know how often we have needed nephrologists or hematologists uh, or cardiologists uh, on, uh, or hep hepatologists. Uh, and uh, these people may be excellent nephrologists or hepatologists uh, in, in, you know, and, uh, and do an excellent job in their field but they may not have experience with gene therapy and therefore they need to be told in advance of the study and of the possible side effects and on the way these have been treated in clinical trials or, uh, or as part of the previous experience. And of course, intensive care unit and sometimes invasive radiology also need to be uh, involved. 
so what should we do to prevent the possibility of having adverse events? Well, of course, we always perform uh, antibodies uh, against uh, the vector before we start the therapy, but it's also extremely important, uh, and this is very important that the families understand the importance of providing details on the on the past and recent clinical history. We need to know if there are risk factors, if a child has already had a, any immune problems, and especially if there have been recent infections. We know that families are often very keen. They are so keen to enter the study. They may just uh, neglect to provide uh, detailed information on recent infections uh, or, on, on, or on other possible risk factors. And this is... Uh, uh, potentially uh, uh, very dangerous because we know that uh, in some cases uh, of patients who had very serious adverse events, uh, um, th there was a recent, a, a, a recent history of infections which had not been uh, uh, demonstrated or, or neglected. At the time of dosing, uh, we also uh, perform blood tests to make sure that uh, at baseline uh, there are no um, levels of, uh, um, um, of uh, um, kidney or, or liver um, um, impairments that uh, you know may already start the, the patients with the children may already start with a, with a higher risk and it's very important that uh, at the time when we give a high dose of prednisone which is higher than the one we give normally in the shame standards of care this is uh, continued and it's, it's extremely important that the families understand uh, the value uh, how important it is to take the, this prednisone to modulate the immune responses uh, and that the, the prednisone should always be take, taken according to the prescription of the doctors uh, after the dosing. Yeah. And uh, this is just a general slide of what we do at the time of dosing, which is not particularly relevant for uh, adverse events, but of course all these procedures have to be done in, in you know, in, they have to be in place uh, with standard operating procedures and uh, um, assuring safety on all these uh, steps. Uh, and uh, we go to the post-dosing, which is extremely important. Uh, I mean, this is what families have to, to, to understand, that uh, the follow-up has to be regular. The patients have, the, you know, the families have to follow all the appointments that are given. There is a reason why we ask you to come so frequently in the weeks after dosing. And uh, so the frequency of assessment, the re regular clinic and lab tests that put into schedule are extremely important because if something becomes obvious, it has to be detected as soon as possible and treated as soon as possible. And the other key word is continuation of prednisone as from schedule, never miss a dose. We have uh, patients who may be vomiting, you know, if, if this happens, you have to contact your, your physician and make sure that there is a way of uh, either uh, giving it orally if it's possible, or there are other ways of giving the, the steroids, but it's extremely important there are no doses missed uh, at any time uh, during the follow-up, especially in the in the first four to eight weeks uh, after, after dosing. Uh, and uh, if we go back to our initial scheme of what we see following the, the AV-based gene therapy administration, and we focus on the uh, possible adverse events soon after dosing. In the first two weeks, uh, uh, we usually prefer to have uh, uh, the, the, the family in, in if, if the family lives far away, we, we prefer to have them being close to the hospital for the first two weeks in the same city or so, you know, not to, not to be hours away or, or, or miles, hundreds of miles away. And, and we know that in the first two weeks, uh, there are some side effects which are very frequent. They are like nausea, vomiting, they are extremely um, 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 uh, frequent and they can be easily treated with uh, um, hydration or uh, taking into account of the possibility of uh, um, uh, disturbances of the adrenal axis in case uh, of uh, profuse vomiting in patients on chronic steroids. Uh, and uh, what is very important is to really check the liver function test. We know that in the first two weeks we can have a uh, increased uh, uh, liver function test that uh, should be monitored and, and treated uh, if uh, present. Uh, it's very important to have full, full blood count, uh, troponin I to check for possible cardiac signs, uh, coagulation and renal function test. Uh, and uh, it's very important that uh, 
not only that we know how to treat them, uh, but this plan is pre-discussed uh, and is pre-discussed with everyone who is involved. These things often happen on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on a holiday or you know, on Christmas Day or, or during, during weekends, and it's very important to have a pre-discussed plan activated in any event. Uh, after the first two weeks, uh, the children can generally return locally. You know, this is not a strict rule, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's something, it's, it, it's, if you want to play it safe, it's better if, if, the, if the family is, is close to the, the center where the dosing has been done. And uh, uh, if we go back to the, to, the, to the previous scheme, we know that after the first week, at the end of the first month, in the few months, the first three months after post-impusion, it is, it's really important that we plan monthly uh, assessments for bloods uh, and uh, liver function and other assessments uh, plus uh, we do we have a proper plan for steroid tapering there is a, a, a prefix plan for steroid tapering but this may be changed or altered uh, depending on uh, uh, whether there has been the need to increase steroids for uh, um, platelets or liver um, issues and uh, uh, we have to be um, um, aware that we may have to change the plan for steroids in crystals uh, if we have uh, some uh, um, uh, increased liver enzymes uh, and uh, um, and uh, what is the plan of action if, if this uh, increased liver enzymes are not just mild they are, they are they are more severe and uh, um, so it's very important that we are all aware of uh, what are the the risks that we know uh, they are um, uh, possibly uh, uh, identified because we know how common they are, like hepatotoxicity, we have the experience of thrombocytopenia, and in SMA, for example, we had some cases of PMA that were never present uh, in, uh, uh, in, um, in the clinical trial, uh, but it's also important what is the important potential risk, and th this is something which comes from from SMA with, uh, with, with, uh, with other adverse events. And I kept it just to keep in mind that uh, not always we know when we, we do the follow-up of possible adverse events that may become useful. So what are the uh, mitigation strategy? We know that uh, if we have uh, uh, increased liver enzyme, we have to recognize them as early as possible. And we know that uh, in the great majority of cases, uh, uh, this uh, can be easily treated with just an increase in, in the steroids dose. And if they are mild, we may not even need uh, an increase in steroids. Uh, and we know about platelets uh, and, uh, and, and we know about possible cardiac adverse events. So it, I, I'm not, you know, I, I know that the audience here is not of uh, uh, physicians who will treat this as mainly families, but it's just to make you aware that uh, how important it is to monitor these uh, uh, all these aspects because if they if we know what they are at baseline and we monitor them over time we can easily treat them as soon as they become obvious if they become obvious uh, so what are the conclusions is that uh, there are some safety risks which are associated with gene therapy uh, there are uh, there have been higher risks that uh, Professor Montoni will discuss uh, later when he will talk about uh, the immune responses. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm just talking more generally on, uh, on the more common risk that we see. And we know that this uh, safety adverse events, uh, the safety risk, these adverse events uh, that are associated with gene therapy may be serious, but uh, they become much more serious if they are not anticipated and they are not recognized early. So many of them are predict predictable, they can be monitored, and they can be managed uh, through diligent standards of care. And sometimes we require medical intervention like increased uh, intervention. But also we know that uh, even if we have these expected uh, adverse events, there may be some unexpected adverse events as it has happened in gene therapy with Duchenne. And therefore, we really need careful attention during follow-up, not only to what we are expecting, but also to any other sign which doesn't look right. You know, I, I have a personal experience of, of some unexpected adverse events uh, and only because we were paying extra attention also to other signs that were not part of the regular follow-up that uh, we were able to identify them and to treat them as early as possible with, with a similarly a good outcome. So the key final, the, the take-home message is really monitor, monitor, monitor. And for the families, please be compliant with the schedule that the physicians will ask you to, 
um, to, to attend. So compliance and monitoring are really the two key questions to reduce the risk of the serious adverse events. And I think uh, this is my last slide and I'm happy to take uh, um, um, to, re to address questions uh, in, the, in the final discussion. Thank you. So a big thank you to Professor Mercuri for this uh, talk. And again, uh, later there will be questions and answers and then we can uh, uh, thank him in person as well. For now, the next speaker on the program is Professor Francesco Montoni. We are a little bit ahead of schedule. We were afraid he was late, but there he is. Fantastic. Thank you for uh, uh, being here uh, already. And the title is uh, Immune Responses in Gene Therapy. This is Professor Francesco Montoni, pediatric neurologist in Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children in London. The floor is yours. Thank you for uh, asking me to present. Uh, I think the, my presentation is is quite general, uh, but I think will be probably lend itself to question and answer. I think that this um, some of my disclosure, I am involved in many of the AV gene therapy trials and uh, uh, together with, and, and in, in my hospital, um, uh, essentially every gene therapy trial on Duchenne and spinal muscular atrophy we are involved with in a way or the other. And I my point will really complement what you heard before from Anemika and from Eugenia. And I will discuss about two uh, aspects. My topic is a potential of adverse event and immune response in particular after gene therapy. And I will describe two types of uh, issues we see in clinic. The first relates to the, so let me just put pointer option. Yeah, the first two, AV vector adverse event, the second to the transgene. And I will explain this point uh, a little more carefully. So the first one, that is the vector immune response, it should not be a surprise because virus do cause a immune response. Uh, when we get the flu, that's uh, what happens. Now, when we say that the AAV vector are non-pathogenic, meaning in nature do not cause disease, this is absolutely true. However, in nature, we don't inject the level of doses of AV we give to children with neuromuscular disorders. And therefore, it's a bit like water. It's not toxic, but I think if you drink too much, then at some point you may run into trouble. So I think that the problem is not so much the AAV per se, but the quantity that is given. And just to give an idea, the quantity uh, of vector that is given compare and protein that eventually is produced is much more compared to any of the vaccination we get in life. It's probably a single AV is still much more than any of the vaccination we, one will get in, in, in an entire life. So I think that the quantity uh, of uh, viral vector are uh, not trivial. And of course, that means that the body recognize that there is something that is not right. That is also why very often in the first few days, children may have a flu-like illness. I think Eugenio has described some vomiting, some fever-like, an asthenia, and children feel for one or two days um, a little under the sun, their appetite may go a little. That is, you know, you must have had flu in the past. This is what happens when we get flu. You know, we are not absolutely, we, it's not that we are very severely affected, but that I think is, is one of the issues. And I think the, to be a little more precise, the vector when is given, of course is given a, in, in Duchenne as a infusion in the vein. And therefore the question is, yes, there is this flu-like issue, let's say, but where does the viral go? And is this relevant for the adverse event? And when we give this, this viral vector, uh, in the vein, there is not that they go to the muscle only. That will be fantastic. And there is a lot of work to identify things that will either only or very 
preferentially go to the muscle, but in reality, the AV vector goes around the body and it goes into the liver. And therefore, is this is probably the most common adverse event uh, that we see in clinic. Is, is That's also why uh, Eugenio was stressing the importance of uh, sticking to the corticosteroid regime, because this is something now we understand reasonably well, we can control, but what you don't want is to uh, miss this because the uh, intervention will be dependent on how many or how much your liver or the liver of these children is responded to this inflammatory event. This is typically, therefore, something that comes relatively early on at the time when uh, a lot of viral vector is still going around. There is a um, problem related to the blood vessels, at least for some of the uh, gene therapy programs. When I say blood vessel, I mean there may be complication related to uh, some uh, 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 coagulation problems. Uh, there may be a particular problem that may affect indirectly the, the, the kidney as well. But this is largely speaking related to the role that the viral vector has in blood cells that circulate and in the uh, blood vessel themselves. These are not common. I think, importantly, these are not common. Importantly, if we monitor for this, we can be quite effective in treating them. So it's not just to say there is just a big problem and there is nothing we can do. It's the other way around. There is a problem. If we do nothing, it can become a big problem, but there are things we can do. And also, in the heart, the heart may be uh, more susceptible compared to skeletal muscle, for example, to high viral, uh, high doses of viral vector. And for, of course, for Duchenne, we also want the, the, the viral vector to go to the heart because that, I think, is one important area where we want to correct the uh, defect and the deficiency of dystrophy. But at the same time, is the balance, if you put too much viruses, the heart may not be, at least for a period of time, not completely happy. I think that, so these were the adverse events that are essentially, sorry, let me go back one. So these are essentially um, a little more, a little less, this viral vector a little more, that one a little less. But I think we'd be fair to say these are pretty universal and they may be, is also uh, well known outside the field of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. They are occur in spinal muscular atrophy, they occur in other conditions where high dose of AV is required. So this is not related to what you stuff inside the AV, but is related to the uh, viral vector, the, the envelope that uh, you use to deliver the gene. Now, there may be problem related to the gene. I call transgene means the gene that you have now, the microdystrophy, let's call it the microdystrophy, is much more common. Now, let, let's start with the bad news, but actually there is a good news that comes. But the bad news is that the, we all know that the body, our body, does not necessarily like to receive things from somebody else. And, you know, transplant immunology people have known this for a very long time. And transplant immunology is probably not the best of the example, but I, I'm just using it as a broad example. The reason why it's not the best of the example is because when you transplant, so say that I need a kidney. If I need a kidney from my brother, uh, it's not a single protein. You know, when we give the microdystrophy, it's a single protein. In the uh, kidney that I may receive from my brother, I have thousands of protein because we are different. So that is, I think, a very uh, more significant risk for rejection. And that is why there is matching to look at the optimal donor first, so that there is as little difference between me and the person who my, my, I may get the kidney from. And also immunosuppression may be needed. So I think it's not a surprise that if you're missing something and you're getting something, especially if this is not yours, I suppose, uh, to start with, uh, you may reject it. And in theory, and all Duchenne 
have mutation that abolish the production of dystrophin. So theoretically, this is when I say the bad news is theoretically, every single child with Duchenne should not tolerate microdystrophin because they never seen it before and should reject it. However, before you get too depressed, that is not the case. Why? Because for two reasons, at least, and many more that perhaps we do not understand yet well, and I think there is a lot of work that has been uh, going on, and there, there are some of the companies that will be presenting after me may allude to some of this as well. But the, the reason why, if you like, the statement that every child with Duchenne should reject the microdystrophin is, is not true, is that in reality, when we, and we publish, and many, many of us uh, have been working on this field many years, I think it is essentially exceptional that a person with Duchenne has got a zero dystrophin. Most patients, and when I say most patients, in actual fact, probably 98% of the individual with Duchenne have the ability to produce very low level of dystrophin. And this is not probably enough to make a big difference in the outcome from a muscle perspective, but it's sufficient for the body to say, I've seen some dystrophin before. So if I see, if you inject another dystrophin afterwards, it's not a completely foreign body, okay? The second issue is that all, all of us and all people with Duchenne produce eutrophin. As you are, are realize, this is a dystrophin-like protein. The, it, it is possible, this is, not absolutely certain, but it is possible that some area that that eutrophin can therefore uh, allow, because it's very similar, that the body does not recognize macro, even if there was a zero production of dystrophin before birth, let's say, that the body would still see uh, and, 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 and have a look at macro dystrophin and say how similar it is to eutrophin. If it is very similar or identical in that area, then I think that this should protect from immune rejection. I use on purpose the word sh should and so on and so forth because in reality, in clinical trials and in novel therapies, we learn all the time. So we are learning as investigators, the companies are learning as, as, uh, you know, as sponsors. So I think it needs to be understood that this is uh, we, we are looking at areas that nobody had looked at it before, and therefore um, there, there are sometimes problems that have been that can de develop. And I'm going to discuss about a problem, and this I will be relatively. Uh, it is a relatively complicated thing because here um, is on the, um, if you like, on the top. Uh, uh, well, let me, sorry, let me re-explain. So it's relatively complicated because what I said so far was contradicted by finding in luckily a very small number of children, in five children, uh, who actually did definitely develop a rejection, let's call it, uh, or a reaction against the injected dystrophin. Why did they do it? And I think, let me take you through this slide. So this is on the top, this is the dystrophin as it is in normal dystrophin. On the bottom is the parts in white that are missing in the micro dystrophin. And as you can see, these are the different um, uh, 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 transgene. They're very all very similar, but they are not identical in the color. In the color, there is a, this is the geniton one, for example. You can see the geniton one and the solid one are different. Here, there are a few exons a few bits that the solid one doesn't have. However, the solid one then has more on this area and this area. And I think you, you appreciate there are some subtle difference. However, what these children had, well, actually all the, although there are some differences, there are some areas where they, all the macro dystrophin are identical. And I think you recognize that in this area, for example, all the micro dystrophin have the same, are all colored. That means, that this part from um, this exon here to here, and for example, here to here, is present in all uh, transgene. So what this group of children had 
uh, these were the four, five children, had relatively large deletions that are not particularly common, but they all remove a part of the gene that was only present in the um, was was present in the in the microdystrophin, but these children had never seen it before. And of course, when I did say that most children produce some dystrophin, they produce some dystrophin at the either end of what is missing, but they cannot produce the dystrophin that is missing um, because of the deletion. So what was what became clear is that some of the mutation in this area uh, are quite uh, uh, crucial because this is not an area that the body uh, likes necessarily to see again uh, if this was completely missing from the beginning. And I should also say this particular area, while this remains a speculation, is quite different between dystrophin and neutrophin, so that might not help. So this was a problem, and uh, Eugenio indicated before that this is why in the first you know, few weeks and months is important to uh, look at the individual who received gene therapy carefully, because this could have been a big problem. It was a significant problem. Many of these children ended up uh, in hospital. Many and some ended up needing to, uh, ventilatory support for a period of time. They became very weak. In a few, the heart was transiently a concern, but I think they all got better um, after you know a, a lot of uh, a lot of help from the immunology colleagues and uh, intensive care unit colleagues. And while they now went back to uh, if like they they recovered from this problem, at the same time, um, this was clearly at risk for this patient. We, nobody had anticipated this, just to be clear. This wasn't uh, something that the field ever thought it could be uh, happening, but now we are a little more clever. And this led to, uh, if you like, uh, modification. And I think that comes back to the point that we all learn and the company learn. This it leads to changes in the type of deletions that uh, may be uh, eligible or not eligible. And if there are differences, is also related to the fact that some of the microdystrophin are a bit different. So I think now, for example, some deletions are uh, especially the one in this, oops, yeah, the, the, those in this area, they are considered potentially at risk uh, and therefore um, there is, uh, you know, a, a, a quite a lot of care if the, any of this patient uh, uh, needs to receive the uh, AB gene therapy. I think that I, I would say the um, I was involved together with other colleagues and Kasten Bonham and many others in trying to facilitate a discussion between the various companies because this was clearly an issue for those children who received the gene therapy, but also for the, the companies to take things forward, because this was something that none, nobody had anticipated, affected children in different programs. And therefore, there are learnings for everybody here, so that you know, if uh, one problem has been noticed in, uh, in one particular subgroup of children, well, you don't continue to recruit these children, because that is at risk to the, those, those children. So I think that this was uh, encouraging to see that the companies were able to um, to um, if you like uh, share the information, this led to exclusion that may be a little painful on one hand. At the same time, I can guarantee uh, uh, that there is a lot of work for uh, to try to understand how to potentially dose these children. Also, it appears that while that particular missing part is pretty um, complex. Not everybody who has received the gene therapy develop this problem. So I think a number there is a lot of work to try to understand why some did, why some didn't, and I think that is again I would think is a, a lot of excellent work that a number of sponsors are doing. And I think this is my last part to say that uh, I stress what you heard before. We are learning every day. 
this is not uh, you know, a drug for hypertension that uh, a million people or more have taken. This is, this is a drug that only a relatively small number of people have taken. We're all different. You know that you know, at home, somebody gets the flu, somebody is hardly touched by the flu, some other, other people are more significantly touched. That is not just bad luck, it is because we're all a bit different. We're trying to understand what is that makes us or the people with Duchenne different from each other and what could be risk factor uh, and so on and so forth. And um, I think that, in, again, uh, careful monitoring and, uh, and uh, uh, is uh, help, very helpful to avoid a significant adverse event. And hopefully you have been listening to me and I stop sharing. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Montoni, for having time for this fantastic talk and also for your work you have done to bring people together to discuss um, gene therapy with uh, several companies and groups. Uh, also a big thank you for that. Then the next speaker is uh, Dr. Chet Vila about uh, gene therapy and the heart. He's a pediatric cardiologist at Cincinnati Ch Children's Hospital, but I see uh, he has it in his name tag as well. So it's clear for everyone who you are. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for presenting uh, today. Great. Thank you very much. Here you see my disclosures. Um, before we get started, I think we have to talk a little bit about what we know about the heart and how that has evolved over time. Um, over the last couple of years in particular, our understanding of what is happening in the heart has changed dramatically. Um, a lot of this has been informed by cardiac MRI-based studies, which began in the early 2000s. Um, but over the last two to three years, we really have started to understand the cardiac pathology and, and what is happening much better due to some autopsy and biopsy-based studies. Here you can see a schematic of generally what is happening over time. Um, for most children, they end up having normal function through the school age years um, and no evidence of fibrosis or fibrofatty changes. The way that we are able to detect that fibrosis in particular is usually based on cardiac MRI. In rare circumstances, there are other changes that happen, um, but usually it is based on cardiac MRI where that's available. Then beginning in the mid-teenage years, um, we start to see evidence of what we thought was just fibrosis or SCAR by cardiac MRI. What we have started to learn is that is not just fibrosis, but it's actually fibrofatty changes. And those changes look very similar to what we see on MRI of the other muscles and a biopsy of the other muscles. That is very important because how we understand this has implications both for gene therapy, but also when we start medications and how much cardiac tissue is there when we talk about toxicity. As our children get older and get into late teenage years and, and adulthood, we end up seeing cardiac dysfunction where the heart does not squeeze as well. We see much more fibrosis and we definitively see evidence of fatty infiltration and replacement of the heart muscle. We can tell that both by cardiac MRI and by um, autopsy studies in patients who have passed away. And then finally, um, as you get into the um, late teens, 20s, and 30s, we see heart function go down much further. We see extensive areas of fibrosis and fatty replacement of the myocardium, and the heart can start to dilate, and why we call a Duchenne uh, cardiomyopathy um, dilated cardiomyopathy. This is the general schematic, and I told you the average ages of what we are seeing, but that varies quite a bit based on the child. Um, we have some children as young as five or six years of age who can have severe cardiomyopathy. And we have um, patients who are in uh, middle age and adulthood um, in their 30s um, and even early 40s um, who can have relatively preserved cardiac function. Um, we do think that on, on those um, patients who even have normal cardiac function, there still is evidence of fibrofatty changes. They're just less substantial than we see in, in other patients. Here you can see an example from a, a, a young teenage boy um, where, again, we see those changes. So at the top of the screen, you can see white areas. That is areas of fat where the, where the heart has actually been replaced by fat. You see a little area where it's more light pink. 
um, where you see fibrosis. And then at the bottom of the screen, you see areas of more typical cardiac muscle. Why this matters is this one was in a patient who had preserved cardiac function, but still had evidence of replacement of, his, of areas of his heart with fat and ongoing injury. Um, we are able to tell that by cardiac MRI, as I mentioned earlier, but it is also important to know that we have other ways to detect it, um, in particular, um, production of troponin I, which you heard from Dr. Mercury, and that is very important when we're trying to understand what is what is going on in the heart already versus what is a potential side effect of gene therapy. Here you can see um, a, a recent study showing the changes that happen in terms of cardiac MRI um, by age. So um, on screen left, you can see um, uh, normal cardiac dimensions. And then as things progress, you can see cardiac MRI changes um, at different stages of disease. The really important part about this is while we talk about averages, with some of these changes, you can see that there are children um, under age 10, about 10 to 15 percent um, of those children, um, who will have already significant cardiac injury, either fibrosis and occasionally fibrofatty change, although it wasn't shown in this study. And that is really important when we're talking about understanding the potential side effects of gene therapy, the risks of gene therapy, and where somebody's heart is. As we mentioned earlier, and as you heard from Dr. Um, Mercury, um, troponin I has become the way to look for evidence of cardiac injury. What is very important about this is over the last five years, we have learned that there are patients with Duchenne, many of whom are school age or older, and they will have troponin leak or troponin um, in the blood just at baseline when they're not doing anything. How we learn that is through a couple of things. One, drug-based studies where troponin was used as a safety marker, and we weren't seeing cardiac um, problems, but we were seeing that, that boys and adolescents um, actually had evidence of troponin leak without any kind of cardiac problems. Um, this then prompted us to go and start to look at our patients and see them both when they were sick and when they were not. Um, and see if there was um, evidence of this more broadly, and it was. Um, this um, was important both for the, the drug toxicity studies that were ongoing, um, but also in clinical care. We had a number of adults that we were taking care of who had this evidence of troponin leak, um, and they sometimes had EKG abnormalities, and they were taken um, out to other institutions because people were worried they were having a heart attack or they were worried they were having viral myocarditis. Those two points in particular are especially relevant when we talk about what is happening um, from gene therapy. While overall, what has been described as the cardiac toxicity as myocarditis, I think it has become very unclear that that is not all um, uh, what is actually going on. And it is, I think, actually clear that in not all cases where we see evidence of troponin leak in the blood, that what is happening is actually inflammatory in nature. That has important implications for a couple of things. One, if we try and treat something that is not inflammatory in nature with immune suppression, with huge doses of steroids, we may be using the wrong sorts of therapies. But also, we may also need to understand that the toxicity may be different at different stages. Here you can also see why this was important. This was actually before many of the gene therapy studies that, that have already been described were going on. We realized this was a problem um, because we were starting to see um, abnormalities in troponin, and we have to understand this both from a safety perspective, from an FDA perspective in terms of reporting, but this is also very important clinically. If we see evidence of this troponin leak, um, what does this mean over the long term? And here you can see a schematic of what that is. So myocarditis is a very small portion of what can happen from a cardiac injury perspective more broadly and in Duchenne. And 
um, depending on which stage of gene therapy and what the diagnostic testing looks like, there may be cardiac injury that is happening that is not inflammatory in origin um, or is inflammatory in origin, and we're going to have to treat it in very different ways. And we need to understand this better over time. But I think what I also liked about Dr. Mercury's presentation is he was referring to it as cardiac injury. I think right now, as we are starting to piece together what is happening and at what stages, that's what we have to talk about, um, because some of it may be inflammatory and some of it may not be. And so when we talk about the cardiac risks, um, similar to what you heard from Dr. Montoni, there are very different stages um, of, of what we expect from a cardiac perspective in terms of potential toxicity and how we may be able to monitor. So very early, as you heard, there may be an immune reaction to the virus. This is important because that immune response um, in may be different in different tissues, um, and the effect in different tissues may be, may be substantially different. The other thing that is very important as a cardiologist who takes care of many people with Duchenne, both young and old, is we can see evidence of cardiac injury, sometimes substantial cardiac injury, just in response to stress. So when we have young boys sometimes, but also teenagers and adults who come in with non-cardiac problems, and we look at their troponin levels, and we look at what happens to their heart function, sometimes they get a stress response, which leads to an early change in cardiac function, release of lots of troponin. Sometimes they recover, but sometimes they don't. And I think we have to use that as the paradigm when we're talking about therapies um, for gene therapy related toxicity and how it impacts the heart. Because as you heard from both Dr. Mercury and Dr. Montoni, how we treat this is very different, whether it's inflammatory or non-inflammatory. And our expectation for what sort of recovery may happen is also very different depending on which one of those responses we're seeing. Over the midterm, as you heard, um, the, you may develop an immune reaction to the new dystrophin, the microdystrophin more generically for most, for most of the therapies that we're talking about um, can uh, cause an immune response. So one of the other things that I do is heart transplantation. And as one of the things that we monitor for over time is an immune response to new things that are introduced to the body. And as you heard, for some people, that appears to be microdystrophin, although we're trying to sort out the subtleties of that. And then finally, over the long term, there are real questions about whether this is going to impact the heart. One, is there going to be earlier cardiac progression in disease due to an initial injury that may not have been huge in the beginning, but over many, many years, adds up over time, weakens the heart a little bit earlier, and then speeds up the progression that I talked to you about in the beginning, but also, too, if the, the boys um, are stronger over time, um, can that additional load, that additional work, um, do additional um, damage to the heart over time? Um, because we don't know the differential effects, even though the different um, therapies um, uh, appear to impact the heart, we don't know what that's going to look like in an individual patient and more broadly. So some may have more skeletal muscle effect, some may have more cardiac effect, and there is likely to be individual variability within that group. So we still have to watch for the heart over time. So how do we do that? Um, this is very important. Early on, um, and depending on where you're at, um, echo is going to be the primary way to do that. So ultrasound of the heart to look at heart function and how that progresses. Where there may be some additional information to be gained is with cardiac MRI. This is not necessarily available in every place or at every age. For young children, they may not be able to tolerate laying down for a cardiac MRI. At our institution, usually we're able to reliably do this between um, 8 and 10 years of age, depending on the person. Um, but as you heard, and, and based on what has been uh, approved from an FDA perspective, um, a, a cardiac MRI may not be doable in the very young children. 
Um, two, um, from a rhythm perspective. So whenever there's any kind of cardiac damage, especially if there is myocarditis and inflammatory um, perspective, this can set off abnormal rhythms in the heart, which can be um, potentially dangerous. So we have to watch this by looking at just your EKG when you come into clinic, which is the one that, that almost every center will, will get when, when a boy comes in, um, but also with monitoring for, for arrhythmias or abnormal rhythms when you go home because you may feel fine when you're in clinic and then when you go home and you're vomiting or you're feeling your heart racing or other stressors come about, that may be an additional stress that leads the heart to be more irritated from an electrical perspective and can, and can induce potential arrhythmias. And then finally, the blood test, much of which you've already heard about and which I already discussed from a troponin perspective. So we know that we need to follow these things early um, within the first couple of days and within the first couple of months as that new gene is produced. Exactly the best way to do it and how to react, we're still sorting out over time. The other part that is very important, um, as you heard, is there needs to be emergency planning in place. You need to know who the team is that is going to be looking at cardiac testing, being able to understand what a person's cardiac um, disease looks like to begin with, their heart function, their troponin levels, their rhythm monitors, all those sorts of things, and to put that into, into full context, because that's going to vary based on your age and what your heart looks like to start with. And also for people who do um, uh, have a significant cardiac injury and go into cardiac failure, understanding whether mechanical circulatory support or ventricular assist devices, heart pumps can be used or, or will be used um, to try and support the heart. This is especially important because trying to figure this out in very short notice, if somebody gets very sick very quickly, can often be very challenging. And you may miss a window by which new therapies if it's, if it's myocarditis and inflammatory driven, or um, if it's heart failure related, um, you may miss that window where you can try and uh, use therapies um, to support somebody through the acute phases of disease. So how are we trying to do this more broadly? Um, the group that we have, which is a, um, an international group um, um, called Action Muscular Dystrophy, we, are, we have put together a harmonization document to try and guide what we think is the best way to try and, one, evaluate heart disease at baseline and as things progress. Um, and we're also sharing our experiences because we know we are still in the very early stages of understanding what this means, what are, what are the problems going on, what is myocardial injury, and what is myocarditis, and to be able to do that, we are sharing our experiences amongst our groups, um, and um, we are sharing it more broadly um, through these harmonization documents. And so kind of to, to finalize, um, we know that the heart can be affected from, from um, gene therapy. We are still trying to figure out exactly what the problem is and who is most at risk. The best way to be able to do that is to have planning in place so that we know how the heart looks in the beginning, to two, collect the data, especially very early on in terms of what is happening from a cardiac perspective, what is happening from an inflammatory perspective, and then guiding clinical care through the small group of providers that should be helping to guide gene therapy um, in an in individual center. And I'd like to find, finalize it by, by thanking the group. So one, um, within our action muscular dystrophy group, um, Linda Kreip um, and Deep Nandi um, at Nationwide, um, Jonathan Soslo, Beth Kaufman, um, and um, uh, Arvind um, have all helped to put together that harmonization and, and are kind of leading the group as we collect new data to understand what is happening from a cardiac perspective um, in gene therapy. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vela, for your wonderful presentation about gene therapy in the heart. And then it's now the moment to go to the question and answers. And uh, I would like to, to ask the speakers. I see Professor Mercuri also arrived. Hello, hello. So um, to go through the questions, and I will uh, ask them to one of you, but please feel free if so, one of the other speakers feels that they, they would like to give comments on that specific question as well P please feel free we have ample time so there's no reason to hurry on 
and um, we asked the participant to ask questions only on this subject. There are two questions which are not specific on this subject. That's one on stem cells and one of standards of care. They will both receive a link to the information which is available online. And we really will with the questions and as a stick to the gene uh, therapy. So um, the first question uh, is about uh, how much liver damage data has come out is it something that is manageable if the liver is injured uh, during a gene therapy? Is, is that one we can ask to Professor Mercuri? Um, yeah, sure. Um, well, the um, let's say that the level of liver impairment so far has not been, uh, has generally been uh, um, well controlled by just an increase in, in, uh, in steroids. So it has not been... Uh, uh, a major issue in uh, you know the increase that we have seen uh, have we have been quite manageable. Okay, thank you so much. And then there's a question I would like to ask to Professor Montoni: Is uh, what are the ideas about uh, redosing? Um, so uh, I I will I will say two things. In actual fact, just to add to what Eugenia was saying, the um, is important one thing that uh, we are now, um, especially after information that it came from another gene therapy trial on the condition called mitubular myopathy. We are much more careful in the pre screening to make sure that the people with Duchenne, but also with other conditions, if they need AV gene therapy, they don't have a pre existing liver problem. And uh, I think that can be occasionally an issue. And uh, I think, but this can be easily pre-screened. I think regarding the, the redosing, the, um, this is, I think, at the moment, challenging. There is work that has been done to try to, uh, mostly in preclinical model, to try to uh, uh, reduce the uh, inflammatory infiltrate that, or the inflammation that is given at the time of the AV gene therapy by uh, immunosuppression. Now, in, in animal models that do not have a muscular dystrophy, this is largely work that has been done, for example, by, and has been presented by colleagues from Geneton, and Serge Brown gave a presentation at one of the parent project meeting quite recently. So if you do it in normal mice, and you give an AV9, whatever, then uh, immunosuppress this mouse significantly. And then after a period of time, you redose. Uh, that is possible in, in a mouse model with muscular dystrophy that is much more challenging because the muscular dystrophy environment is already an inflammatory environment. So I think when you give the gene therapy, uh, there is an extra boost, let's say, of inflammation and the appropriate level of immunosuppression to control this at the moment in human are not known. This doesn't mean it could not be done in the future, but if the question is, can we do it today? I think the honest answer is no. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm sure that we will have series of webinars about gene therapy about in the next year. So we will come back to this question and see what is known in two or three years about the uh, opportunities uh, for redosing. Thank you so much. And then there's a question which I think is for Anamika, and that is how can the effectiveness of microdystrophin and axon skipping therapies be compared in terms of their ability to increase dystrophin levels? There is no correlation announced comparing microdystrophin and partial dystrophin in axon skipping. Yeah, so I think so. The nice thing is that this question was there. So I, I, I could look up a slide that I have on exactly this topic, so you should you should see it now. Um, so I think so. Just to to compare, I I'm not gonna say um, one is better than the other or or one works and the other doesn't. Um, so Excel skip um, is approved. Sorry, I get a lot of Zoom messages. Hopefully, I don't disconnect. Um, Exo skipping is approved by uh, the FDA. Microdystrophin is also approved by the uh, by the FDA. Um, so the regulatory status is the same. It's both accelerated approval based on dystrophin. 
What we know for axon skipping is that the dystrophin that is produced is functional in humans because we have Becker. So Becker patients have these, these, um, uh, these dystrophins. We know that they have a slower disease progression than Duchenne. So we know that these axon skip dystrophins are more functional um, than not having dystrophin. For microdystrophin, we don't know that yet. Um, we know that we can re-express micro or express microdystrophin after treatment, but we don't know whether it's functional because this data is not yet there as I presented. Um, however, so we know that the exon skip dystrophin is functional, but we also know that the exon skipping trials result in very low levels of this Becker-like dystrophin, up to 5%, but more often in the less than 1% range. So that's really very little. While the microdystrophin, well, we can reach over 70% for some patients um, where most of the fibers are positive, while with axon skipping, only a few fibers are positive. So yes, we know that the axon skip dystrophin is functional and we don't know that yet for microdystrophin, but the question is whether the levels that we now have for axon skipping in the trials and in the, in the treatment, whether that is enough to slow down disease progression, we don't know. The levels that we produce for microdystrophin, if the microdystrophin is functional well, at these levels, it should do something. Exon skipping is, of course, mutation specific. So the ones that are approved, you need to have an eligible mutation. For microdystrophin, almost all patients are eligible except for the patients with the mutations at the beginning of the, of the protein, as was explained by me and by Professor Montoni. And that is because we are worried about this severe autoimmune response where patients will start breaking down their, their, their muscle and their heart. Other comparisons for axon skipping. Currently, the regimen is weekly intravenous infusion, but with microdystrophin treatment, you're treated just once. So also for, say, side effect, yes, with microdystrophin, the side effects are severe to very severe, but they happen once. I mean, you treat, and then there's, there's a couple of weeks and months where you might see side effects. Longer term, it seems not to induce extra side effects. With exon skipping, we know it's well toler tolerated, but the burden of weekly intravenous infusion, of course, is there. And then the duration of the fact for exon skipping, as long as you keep treating, there will be exon skipping, there will be dystrophin restoration. But with the microdystrophin, as I explained, we know that with time, the levels will likely go down. So you probably were hoping that I could say, well, exon skipping is better than microdystrophin or the other way around. It's not that simple. They are different. And there's, there's, there's currently pros and cons uh, uh, of each. And of course, if we could do with exon skipping, if we could reach the levels of dystrophin that we now have for microdystrophin, um, I mean, that, that would be a different uh, uh, situation, but that is currently not the case. So we have to, to, to compare the very low levels of proteins that we know are functional with the much higher levels of proteins where we don't know yet that it's functional. And sorry for the long answer, but it, it, it was a, a multifaceted question, so to say. Thank you so much, yeah, Annemiek. Is there, as, as I saw some heads shaking here, are there one, is there any of the other speakers who want to comment on this as well, or do you feel this answers it all? Okay, then um, a new question came in from Minas, and that is, and that's a um, a question for Dr. Avila. I think it is. It scares me a lot when I hear about a cardiac issue when it comes to gene therapy. Can some ideas be shed on what are done to prevent cardiac injury? Yeah, I think what is what is really important. I think is stressing what we don't know. Um, and while generally what people have talked about is calling it again myocarditis, I want to hit on this point significantly. So one of the patients who passed away who got the CRISPR therapy, when they looked at his heart, there was an evidence of myocarditis, of inflammation, of irritation. And so I think when we talk about how the heart is damaged and when it is damaged, we have to understand what is driving that because you're going to have very different therapies. So if it is inflammatory in origin, we can give immune suppression. We can give high doses of steroids. There are a lot of other immune modulators that go after different types of Im immune cells, B cells, T cells, other things like that, to calm that down. But if it's overall cardiac injury, then usually the answer is we need to support the heart. We need to help it. We need to do things to let the heart recover from the injury that's happened. 
And that's where understanding one, if somebody is considering gene therapy, what their heart looks like to begin with matters. And two, having a cardiologist, not just any cardiologist, one who is used to looking at hearts for people with dystrophenopathy and who can then provide some degree of answers for what it looks like is going on. Is it cardiac toxicity and injury due to an initial stress response, or is it immune modulated? Um, and so I think the answers are going to be very different, and they're going to be individualized in terms of being able to kind of prevent things from the get-go. We don't know the answer to that. What we are saying is a reasonable approach is making sure people's cardiac medications are optimized going into these therapies based on their stage of disease. For generally, if that's somebody who's four to five or four to seven, that very rarely involves cardiac medications except for prevention or prophylaxis. Um, if you do have cardiac disease and you're in that young age and talking about gene therapy, I would have a very in-depth discussion with the neurology and cardiology team that takes care of you because that is very early cardiac disease to begin with. Um, and that would make me a little more worried that your heart is at risk. And I think more broadly, when we starting to talk about how our understanding of cardiac disease is evolving, especially in response to stressors, I like Anamika's presentation, thinking about it as the carabiner. So your heart is at risk for having problems, but until it's stretched, until it's pulled on, you may underestimate the degree of cardiac injury that happens. And then when a stressful response comes out, the heart can't deal with it. It hasn't been pushed to date, but then if it gets gene therapy, if you get an ammonia on top of it, if you get another thing that's going on, then the full extent of the cardiac damage that has happened um, really becomes um, visible and understandable. Um, and so that's where I think having the team, because we're still sorting this out, is important. And we don't have a upfront, here's the best things you can do yet, because we're still trying to understand this. The other part that matters is if a significant amount of your heart has been replaced by fibrosis and fat, the effective gene dose may be very different. And we have to also talk about that. So the, the effective dose that you get when you're young in different tissues may be different when you're older based on the degree of fibro fatty replacement that has happened in an, in an organ. And that may be another modifying factor. So if you already have a lot of fibro fatty scar in your heart, you don't have very many cardiomyocytes that are still there any kind of damage may be more pronounced as well. Thank you so much. This is really very uh, useful for all, uh, all parents in this call and everybody else as well. Thank you so much. I see a new question came up from uh, Lodewijk van der Poel as redosing is tricky. Is it wise to wait with gene therapy for very young boys until maybe more information is available? Who would like to answer this question? I see smile and smile. Well, it, it, it would be okay if this was not a progressive disease. You know, of course, one has to take into account a lot of factors, including, you know, the, the age and how progressive the disease and so on. So one cannot wait too long because the disease will progress and muscle will be replaced and, and uh, the, the substrate, you know, for gene therapy to work on will be less. So, uh, the, 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 for the time being, we don't have too much experience in very, very young children, but uh, um, from the age of four, uh, we see good results. And I see Francesco is ready to add something. No, no, not necessarily to add, but I think is 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 just to continue, uh, uh, you know, along exactly what you said. I mean, firstly, and as all of us have said, there are things we don't know. So you may ask things for which, in all honesty, the best answer, it doesn't exist yet. Um, uh, the, there are clinical studies where AV gene therapy is going to be used in much, much younger children. And, um, uh, the, and then there is an, a small experience, for example, from, um, from Kevin Flanagan, who has those, uh, some children, you know, from the age of six months, or at least one child from the age of six months, and I think that the, you know, in a way, 
the good news is that he works better at that age. The muscle is much better. When he say be work better, it means the amount of fibers that can be transduced is much higher compared to a more advanced case. I think that the, of course, the, the issue that anemic also raise is there may be or there will be more dilution because if you, you know, there is muscle growth and, um, you know, post-pubertally muscle growth is essentially very limited. There will only be the damage that may occur, but at birth or from birth, to puberty, there is, uh, of course, a, lo a, lo a lot of muscle growth. In reality, how these two curves intersect each, each other to give the best outcome, at the moment, there may be opinions, but I don't think there is anybody who says, I, I know this works better than, and therefore, unfortunately, you have to bear with us the uncertainty. And we can discuss the pros and cons, but there is nothing than just be honest to say, well, we're not completely sure because that has not been done yet. There are ongoing stu oh, studies that will start recruiting very soon, going down to birth, essentially, or to, you know, first few weeks of life. Um, but this will take many years to, to, to be done. So I, I like what, uh, in the short term, what Eugenia was also saying, the, you know, if one has the option and and the understanding and belief is that this may be beneficial, then I think waiting for having a lot of, uh, or much more pathology may not be, uh, if you like, the, the you know, ideal choice. But I think if you then want to push just much earlier than the, the age when most of the data is available from four years onwards, then it becomes more difficult. You, you are on mute, Elizabeth. Yes, yes, yes. I was I was clicking, but here I am. Thank you. So thank you so much to all uh, speakers of this session and this earlier session with Annemieke. And now we have a 10 minutes break. Uh, and I hope you all come back for the next session with uh, represent this from uh, industry, the companies who are working on gene therapy at the moment. So see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. Till later. Bye. Okay, welcome back. Um, I hope you all had a relaxing break. Um, what we have now is the, the gene therapy landscape session where um, we will have five presentations from companies. Each of the presentations will take five minutes. Uh, I'm in charge of timekeeping, so I'll use my standardized timekeeping device, my iPhone. Um, and if you're not done after five minutes, I will tell you to, to wrap up. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first speaker, um, which is uh, Carlos Estevez from Pfizer, sorry. And the floor is yours and it starts when you start speaking. Okay, well, thank you so much for uh, for your invitation. It's my pleasure to share with the World, uh, World of Shame community uh, today in order to explain what happened with the current clinical program in Pfizer. As you know, we're talking about the PF926, uh, that is the origin therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. That is a general disclaimer that the information that I share with you today is information that is updated, but also this can change because remember that now we are talking about an investigational product that is not approved yet by the regulatory agency. That is the general picture. And also it was good that uh, Professor Asman talked mm -hmm. with us about the gene therapy. And that is the construction of the gene therapy of, uh, Duchenne, for Duchenne in Pfizer that the name is for the dystrogen Movaparvopec. As you know, maybe most of you hear about what is the construction of the vector. In order to explain this part, imagine that the vector is the vehicle, is a car, that in order that this capsid, that in this case, the AVV9 capsid, ensure that inside the capsid, inside this vehicle, we have the gene of interest, that is the mini dystrophin. The mini dystrophin that works in the case of Pfizer as you see, is mimic what happened with the sequence of the mild DMD gene sequencing. In this approach, because the capacity of the capsid, the AVV9, as all AVV is really low, we need to modify and I create this mini dystrophin in order to ensure that this gene of interest have the capacity to go inside the car. In addition to this, for the gene of interest, that is the mini dystrophin, uh, 3978, also we have a muscle-specific enhancer and promoter. And the reason is because the vector have a specific tropism to the muscle in the skeletal muscle and the heart, 
And when you have a specific promoter, we ensure that the transduction of this information, in this case, the protein, the mini dystrophin, is accurate in terms of the muscles and the heart. And the ADV and I have a high transduction in both tissues. What happened with the current clinical program? We have different kind of phases and also was uh, talking before, and I would like to highlight this part in order to ensure that the information is accurate, that we have the phase 1B that was is, is completed. Uh, in the beginning was included patients, ambulatory patients and non-ambulatory patients. The ambulatory patients is ongoing and the non-ambulatory was put on hold after the, uh, after the fatal event that was reported. Uh, but also we continue working in order to ensure that we can uh, develop the program in order to include non-ambulatory patients in terms of the community and also is planned a phase three clinical trial in that case. It's ongoing or phase three clinical trial that the name is CIFREO. The clinical trial is for ambulatory patients that cover for four to seven years old and includes a, a, include a, a delayed treatment because two thirds of the patients in the beginning receive the gene therapy and then one tier receive the placebo. And then after one year of follow-up and the second year in the beginning of second year, if meet the criteria of eligibility, is moving to receive the group that received the placebo is going to receive the, the gene therapy and the opposite, the other received the placebo. That is the phase three that is ongoing. The recruitment is complete and we expect to have some results in 2024. Then we have the phase two that also is ongoing. Uh, the name of this clinical trial is Daylight. Is for early symptomatic patients. We know in the case of the many rare diseases and most important in the case of the Duchenne muscular dystrophy, early treatment means better outcomes. For the reason we started phase two clinical trial in order to see the safety, evaluate the safety of the patients and will be covered now two, three years, uh, two, three years old and also this planet according to the results in the safety point of view and also the, the uh, transduction of the mini dystrophy moving early ages in the case of the, uh, of the clinical program. Also is ongoing as a conversion study for the family members for any patient that received the gene therapy in order to see if the patient, uh, the family of the patients is convert, is going to neutralize an antibody positive. If you remember the previous presentation about the immunological risk, when you have the exposure for the wild type ABV, maybe you can create antibodies and neutralize antibodies, and maybe you're not eligible to receive gene therapy. Phase three is planned for non-ambulatory patients. Uh, we are working very close with the safety committee and also monitoring all adverse events in order to create a robust plan in order to include for phase three, the non-ambulatory patients. And then all patients that currently participated in any clinical trial for Pfizer is in the long-term follow-up analysis that cover for 10 years, follow-up for all of the patients, all of the boys that participate in the clinical trial. If we see in detail what happened with the different design of the different phases, the ongoing phase one being ambulatory patients was to escalate the dose. We used low dose and high dose, and we have the follow-up for the one year and then the long-term follow-up. The patient received the further distribution of parvovec, and also we measure the safety and tolerability because it's a phase one B. But this data that I'm so far we have- I'm very sorry, but your, your five minutes are up. So I'm gonna ask you to please wrap up. Okay. Then we have the phase three that explained in detail about the delayed treatment the ongoing phase two, that is for the clinical uh, trial design for the early population. And also it's important to mention that everything that is working in the case of the patient engagement is inside caring you, for you, caring for the first kind of the patients. We're grateful that all of you have guided us so far and will continue to partner with the patient organizations and the broader DMD community to ensure that the information about the for the distribution of Vaparvobe clinical trials is shared widely. Thank you so much for the patients for the uh, clinical team, clinical research, and the care community of Duchenne. And also, please, if you have any question, not hesitate to contact us in order to close work very close in anything related to the clinical trials. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Carlos. And sorry to have to, to, to cut you off, but we have four more presenters and we want time for, for Q&As. So if you have questions about this presentation or any of the presentations, uh, please use the Q&A um, uh, uh, function. I'm going to introduce the next speaker um, who works for Roche, and that is Jean-Paul Treffen. And uh, Susie Ann will, will uh, share your slides. So please um, start your presentation and indicate to Susie Ann when you want her to move to the to the next slide. Thank you very much for the invitation and, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jean-Paul Treffen, Global Development Leader for Dylan Distrogene Multi-Power at Roche. Next slide, please. 
So this is a disclaimer for my presentation. Next slide. So in 2019, uh, Roche and Sarepta, we entered in a license agreement for Dylan Distrogene Multipowervet and to be the objective to reach more people with Duchenne faster. Sarepta is responsible for the global development program. We are working together on that, but we are responsible for the global development program and the manufacturing and the commercialization in the US. We at Roche, we are responsible for the interaction with the health authorities in the rest of the world. And also we are responsible for the commercialization of the treatment outside of US. Next slide. We have now treated more than 200 patients across the different studies. Uh, I will not go through each study, uh, because as you can see, we have conducted and uh, many studies ongoing. I'd just like to highlight that the first study, study 101, uh, including four patients, ambulatory patients, four to seven years, is now completed. We have followed this patient for five years. So st the other study which I would like to highlight is Endeavor, study 103. This is the first study we use commercial material. Here we have included different cohorts of patients, first uh, patients, ambulatory patients, four to seven years, but also younger patients, uh, patients three years of age, and older patients, patients, ambulatory patients between eight and 17 years of age, and also non-ambulatory patients without age limit. We also included patients with specific deletion in the DMD gene, and uh, we also will include a, a cohort of two years old patients. Uh, Embark is a first phase three study. You already heard about the results. Uh, we will come to that uh, later in the next slide. I would try to highlight Envision with a study in non ambulatory patients with a cohort of late ambulatory patients. This study has started. We have restarted recruitment in June this year. We will now in US. We will stop recruitment in US and recruit the remaining patients outside of US. Amol is uh, a study in patients below age of four years, and we will go down in a standard way to patients below six months of age as the last cohort. And we have a long-term safety study where patients who have completed the ongoing studies will enter into this long-term follow-up where patients will be followed for a minimum five years. Next slide. These are the results of Embark. You have already heard the results uh, from Professor Arthur Ar Ar Ruiz. Uh, so the primary endpoint is the change in North Star total score from baseline to week 52. Uh, we had in the DNA and dystrogen multipower group an increase of 2.6 points, and in the placebo group an increase of 1.9 points, and difference is 0.65, which is not statistically significant. We also included uh, five different time functional tests as set on the endpoints. The two key set on the endpoints, uh, time to rise from flow and 10 meter watt uh, test, were both statistically significant and also clinically meaningful. The other three functional, uh, functional tests, uh, time to ascend four steps, 100 meter volt test, and SV95C, which is an endpoint linked to the wearable device. Two of them were also statistically significant, time to ascend four steps, and SV95C. Regarding safety, there has been no new safety events compared to the, the studies we have conducted previously, with uh, seven patients reported and a treatment related SAE. Next slide. So what's next? The priorities of course to analyze all data from Embark, which will be presented at the scientific congress and at request to community forums. The ongoing studies are planned to continue. And uh, also what we want to highlight, Sarepta has started to uh, investigate the possibility to treat with uh, patients with pre-existing antibodies. And we are two different approaches. We are tested and the studies will start soon. On the regulatory, from a regulatory point of view, we have also, um, beyond, beyond the finding in US and the approval, accelerated approval in US, we also have used the FDA dossier to find in nine countries. We have already ob obtained approval in UAE and, and Qatar, and uh, the review is ongoing, is ongoing in the other seven countries. Of course, for EMA and PMDA and our, main, our major health authorities, we will take the totality of the data, including Embark, and we plan to discuss with the health authorities early next year. Sarepta is also discussing with the FDA to potentially expand the, the, the label in the US. Next slide. So I would like to finish to thank the patients and their families who take part in the clinical trials, but also I would like to thank you and caregivers who have provided valuable input into the design of the clinical trials. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. And that was to the second five minutes. So very well done. I appreciate that. I'm going to introduce the next uh, speaker who works for Geneton and which, who is Serge Brown. And as Elizabeth already highlighted, he's probably the person who has been working on this the longest out of all of us. So Serge, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, Elizabeth, for your invitation. This slide is actually my uh, disclaimer. I, I am representing a patient organization. I am CSO of AFM Teleton and also head of Neuromaska strategy for Geneton, which is a non-for-profit biotech, not a company. Um, this uh, program is based on an AV8 vector carrying a microdystrophin gene uh, designed by George Dixon and uh, is, um, uh, it's in partnership with Sarepta. It's not the uh, program uh, that, that is uh, developed by Sarepta, it's a different product, uh, but it's in partnership with Sarepta. Uh, based on a whole set of preclinical data, both in dogs and in a very severe rat model, a DMD rat model developed by Caroline Leguina in Nantes, uh, we uh, went for with a full clinical preclinical package with a dose which, uh, as you can see, is lower than the uh, dose used by the other sponsors. is uh, um, much lower, five to ten times lower. Uh, the reason for that is both based on the very spectacular data we had in the animal models with full recovery, full uh, functional uh, recovery in the animal models. And for other reasons, which uh, I'm not um, uh, detailing uh, here, but we will publish some, some more data in the in, uh, near future to show why we should not be so high with this uh, vector. The clinical development program is a, a phase one, two, three uh, uh, trial uh, with a, a, a placebo uh, control part, uh, the pivotal part. And uh, as you heard previously uh, from Francesco, um, we had one case uh, of a serious adverse event uh, happening with our very first patient. It was our very first patient. And um, um, talking to Francesco at that time, even though he could not uh, tell too much uh, for confidentiality reasons, I understood for him that maybe we might not, uh, our case might not be the only one. I realized that. So, uh, and we, um, we thought we should meet with the other sponsors and exchange. And we owe to Francesco and Karsten, and maybe it's also because Geneton is a non-for-profit, that it was actually quite easy. Uh, and the other sponsors uh, should be commended for that. It was rather easy to, uh, uh, to meet and exchange our data. And we, uh, you have seen this uh, from, uh, from Francesco, uh, our patient, uh, has a deletion between exon 8 and 21, um, and he developed an immune response to this region. And we are all working uh, with very sophisticated uh, immunology uh, uh, studies um, on uh, finding more insights into the mechanism involved and how to circumvent that. But anyway, we were able to resume our trial. It took us a year for that. And we are now at this stage, uh, completing the uh, second uh, dose level before jumping to the pivotal part or, or with, an, with an optional cohort of, uh, with a higher dose, which we hope we won't be uh, needing. Um, and I would like to introduce here, uh, to introduce you, this is my last slide, to uh, a body named Isi. Uh, this is a small insight into a question which we all have, how long would it last? Uh, would this gene therapy last? Uh, so this uh, body named EC is a GMD dog that uh, was uh, treated uh, nine years ago, almost 10 years. He was treated at three months. This dog should be, uh, should 
be gone, uh, should be dead for many years. They usually do not exceed two years of age and they all develop cardiomyopathy. And as you can see, at 10 uh, years of age, is very active, very well, has no cardiomyopathy at all. Uh, this is the only dog we, we wanted to keep uh, following our preclinical preclinical studies. And uh, he, as you can see, he's doing uh, pretty well. Um, just an insight on maybe what at least we hope uh, would happen also in human in terms of uh, long-term expression. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ferk. And you, you went slightly over, but even I cannot stop you when you show movies of, of treated dogs playing. So thank you very much for that. Um, we will continue with uh, Dr. Gabriel Brooks from Solid Bio uh, to give his five minute presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And let me just share my screen with you. Um, very hard to uh, follow the presentation of the dogs, but I'll do my best. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'd like to, sh to to thank the World Duchin Organization for for having us. Um, Solid Bioscience is really committed to the proposition that neuromuscular diseases and cardiovascular diseases uh, really warrant um, precision therapies uh, to meet the the high amount need. Uh, for um, for these diseases. And um, Duch uh, in terms of Duchenne, um, solid biosciences um, is, you know, was really founded through people touched by this community. Uh, we've been de dedicated to uh, the development of, of medicines for Duchenne, including really being pioneers in this space uh, with our first uh, gen generation AV gene therapy, uh, which we um, tested in the clinic in 2018, which was alluded to uh, by others in this uh, in this meeting. So with regards to that first generation therapy, uh, we were um, able to conduct in partnership with, with sites and with, with patients and their families, um, a nine patient study, uh, including ambulatory and non-ambulatory boys, uh, where we looked at the safety as well as uh, the expression of microdystrophin in their in their tissues, and then key functional endpoints. Um, that study has concluded. Um, in terms of what the key learnings of that first generation study were, uh, that um, we are able to look at data past one year in all of those nine nine uh, boys. Uh, we had a great deal of experience with some of the side effects that you've heard about today including some three serious adverse events, which occurred quite early after dosing, uh, all, all of which resolved, uh, and which we believe, and, and this has been talked about in this uh, discussion, uh, was uh, due to uh, what's called complement activation, which is some of the response uh, from our, our immune system uh, to foreign material. Uh, and um, I, we, we believe that we've, we've learned a lot from that experience and are poised now uh, to come back into the clinic uh, with a, a next generation therapy. Um, in terms of that IGNITE experience as well, uh, we didn't see any uh, treatment associated adverse events after that early um, period. Um, and uh, we're continuing to follow those boys now um, through five years. Um, we were really encouraged to see that at one year after dosing, um, that there was um, some signs uh, that, that potentially there was improvement in key functional measures. Um, so the way these, these boys are functioning um, as well as how they're feeling. Um, so at this point, we've taken those learnings and now we've pivoted to a next generation program uh, which we're calling SGT003. And this is leveraging um, that microdystrophin uh, on the left side of your screen. This is a schematic um, that has the carabiner parts that latch onto the key portions of the cytoskeleton as well as the outside of the cell, um, but also has a really important domain, the NNOS binding domain, which we think is critically important in terms of muscle perfusion and resilience. We're now pairing that with a uh, a novel capsid, so that truck that people have talked about, uh, which we've found through our own um, development, 
which we believe can target skeletal muscle better and also detarget some of the other tissues like the liver where we might have an immune response uh, that might be um, uh, not helpful and, and potentially uh, could uh, cause uh, adverse events to the patient. We also have a more uh, advanced uh, way of making these vectors, which we believe is important in terms of making the purest uh, product possible for delivery to, to these boys. Uh, one thing to show my mouse data, um, but we also looked at this vector in non-human primates, so monkeys, which we think is the closest system to, to, to humans. And we see that, yes, indeed, this capsid, uh, this truck goes much better to skeletal muscle than a wild type AAV, uh, as well as cardiac, and also avoids the liver. So in the five minutes that, that we have today, this is um, what I, I hope I've been able to share with you, I think, an exciting pivot at Solid Biosciences. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. That was slightly less than five minutes, but perfect. Or you want to continue or? Oh yes, please. So yeah. thank you so you much. Great, minutes. I thought I was, I thought my, my timer had said I was up. So if I could, I really appreciate that. Um, so right now um, we have uh, completed all of the animal work uh, that we, we we believe we need to to um, go to the regulatory authorities so that the, the governmental authorities we partner with in terms of starting new trials. Um, and so we're hoping to start our uh, this next generation AEV uh, microdystrophin gene therapy study uh, as soon as possible and certainly early next year. Thank you so much. Perfect. And now you're exactly five minutes. So well done and thank you very much. Um, we're going to continue to the last presentation, and uh, this is given by someone else who's really been in the field for, for decades, and that is Olivier Darnos from Regenex Bio. Olivier, the, the floor is yours. Um, so thank you, Annemiek, and, and, and thank you for the opportunity to present our Affinity Duchenne program. This is our gene therapy program for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and our product is called RGX202. Um, I, the, on the next slide is my is the forward-looking statements that I need to show. Next slide, go. And next slide, I'll tell you about uh, Regenex Bio. We're an AAV gene therapy company, uh, and uh, basically we have end-to-end -end capabilities from research to clinical development and importantly commercial ready manufacturing for uh, large-scale manufacturing that, that that's required for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Next slide. Uh, we'll get now in the overview of the program. Next slide. Uh, so we're using an AV8 vector, uh, and our construct is shown here. It, it's uh, it's uh, not that different from all of the constructs. It's all in the details, and, and I don't think we have time to get into the details here. Uh, we're using a, a, a muscle-specific promoter, as everybody else. Uh, I just want to point out the fact that we use a, a, a microdystrophin that's a bit longer, that has a, a C terminal domain that we think is useful. Next slide uh, for uh, the, the, the 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 formation of uh, the the dystrophin-associated protein complex and the, the the aggregation of other proteins that are uh, useful for dystrophin function. Uh, in all our preclinical studies, we've been Really amazed by the the the, the, the efficiency, the, the, the activity of this of this microdystrophin, and we're happy to bring it to the clinic. Next slide. Um, now we're going to talk about the 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 the, the ongoing clinical trial, Affinity Duchenne. Uh, this is uh, in 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 this trial, patients are, are brought in for baseline assessment. We include patients from age four to eleven. Uh, we look at their baseline microdystrophin protein expression. Of course, they have none. Uh, we look at their muscle strength and function. We also establish a baseline MRI. And then we dose the patients um, after having started an immunosuppression regimen. Uh, th and this immunosuppression regimen actually includes a, 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 a drug uh, that, 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 that targets the complement reaction, which is the immediate immune, innate immune response that takes place uh, uh, after injection of AAV. Uh, and we first analyze the patients, and I'll show you data at three months. Uh, we, we biopsy the patients in the biceps and look for microdystrophin uh, protein expression. The patients are followed up for one year. Uh, the primary endpoints are safety and tolerability, but we look at muscle strength, function, MRI uh, as, as well. 
So we have we have two groups of patients, uh, uh, two dose, uh, low dose, 10 to the 14, uh, and high dose. Uh, we've started with low dose, obviously, uh, and we include two patients. Then we we can we can expand uh, this this low dose cohort as well as escalate, and that's where we are today. We've completed the first uh, uh, two patients, and we, we're ready to escalate. Um, next slide. Should, we'll show you the, the the interim results next, and I'll, I'll discuss three patients here. And this the data cut here is from a month ago, September twenty eight. And so uh, these patients are, are, have, now, have now been followed up for another an additional month. Uh, three, three patients, I'll show you data on two of them, uh, number one and number two. Next slide. So number one is a patient who's 4.4 uh, uh, 4, 4 year, year old. And uh, we looked on the left-hand side at microdystrophy using two techniques, a Western blood and... and, and uh, <coughs> um, uh, and 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 LC, LC, LCMS, um, and so in both cases uh, we detect uh, uh, robust amounts of microdystrophy. In this case, we calculated this is roughly forty percent of the normal level of dystrophy that we get here at six months. In these patients, we've also measured CK levels, uh, and we see a reduction uh, that that also is so, so the, what, what we what we what we expect to see. Although. Uh, this data is, is in itself is probably not alone to talk about amelioration of function, but this goes in the right direction. Next slide is the second patient, which was a slightly older, 11-year-old, also a signal for microdystrophy uh, that, that's uh, obtained in Western blood and in, in mass spectrometry. Uh, here we see less of the microdystrophy, 11%, uh, but still a strong signal. So this is, next slide, basically where where we are, so I, I, the first patient, just to show you the, yeah, on the biopsy, we can stain for the microdystrophin signal, dystrophin signal, at the, and see, see the distribution of the, the positioning of the dystrophin, the microdystrophin at the periphery, at the sarcolemma as expected. And again, this is three months and this is the first patient. Next slide uh, is the summary. Uh, we show so far good safety. Uh, the treatment was well tolerated in those three patients, uh, and we see expression of, of microdystrophy. We see the, the, the right localization and uh, diminution in serum CK when it was measured. Next slide. I'm going to ask you to please wrap up. Yep, I'm wrapping up. Uh, next next step for us is to dose escalate, uh, and uh, and we 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 we're dosing the the next patient uh, very soon uh, in at, at dose level two. Pivotal plans, we expect to make pivotal dose determination next year and, and, and initiate the pivotal program. And uh, then our, our strategy would be to obtain accelerated approval based on uh, microdystrophin expression as a, as a surrogate endpoint. And we have commercial ready uh, CGMP material uh, for, the, for these trials. Next slide. Uh, just want to enhance, uh, I mean, mention the value of connecting with the Duchenne community. That's uh, clearly very important for us. And the last slide is about uh, just the fact that you can get in touch with us anytime you want. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Olivier. Um, so this was the last presentation that bring, brings us to our, our panel discussion where we can ask questions. Um, and I would like to ask the presenters to, to please um, uh, activate their cameras again. And also we have a panel member who did not present and that is James Richardson from Sarepta. So he's there as well. And um, please, I will, there, many of the questions are for multiple people. So people will probably want to know all the different companies, what they're doing, but I'm gonna kick off as a chair with a specific question to Serge uh, about the, the, the EC dog. So did you take a muscle biopsy from that dog? And do you know how much microdystrophin the dog is expressing after nine years? No, and I, I can tell you why, because we don't want to take any risk with these dogs. We'll be waiting for his uh, final days. Okay, good. So I'll, I have to be patient and hopefully for a long time. Yeah. Okay, thank but you for you, that. You will get complete set of data from all muscles, heart, and every That's tissue. Well, let, let's let's hope it will take a while. I don't want to I don't want to wish for a for a dog to, to die, obviously. Um so then we have questions coming in from the from the audience. Um and 
um, it's more or less expected. Uh, they are uh, along the same vibe. Um, how do you determine where you do your clinical trials? Um, what about applying for approval in other uh, jurisdictions and then specifically the, the, the European medicine agencies and, and, and the UK? And a specific question, what about trials and marketing in China? So I'm just going to go through everyone in the order that you appear on my screen. Um, and then if you can answer the questions on why do you do your trials where you do them? Um, what about uh, the, the, the European um, uh, uh, regulatory filing and what about China? So Olivier, if you can go first. Yes, so uh, in the initial trial, which you know will enroll a maximum of eighteen patients, this will be uh, this 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 will be done in in the in the USA for for really practical reasons. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're not interested in the rest of the world, and and we're already you know having contacts with the EMA and 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 others, and definitely uh, at the end of the day, we have a, a global strategy, and we will address the, the 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 issue in patients from the rest of the world. Okay, and then next up is Carlos. Hey, hello, thanks for the question. Yes, in terms of the eligibility of the clinical trials, we're talking about the phase three clinical trials, the CIFREO, is worldwide clinical site locations across the USA, Europe, and also even in the in the rest of the continents. Uh, we uh, now is full enrolled. All of the patients are uh, with, uh, with respect to get dosed and then get the final data for 2024. Related to the uh, to the regulatory agencies, yes, our plan is to move for the different regulatory agencies, including FDA and EMA, as soon as we can the data and we're able to fill in the and submit the data. In terms of the China, currently we have a natural history of the disease in China is uh, is, is current and we expect to have a publication. Uh, uh, I hope then the end of the ne uh, in the beginning of the next year. And then also uh, to expand, depending on what's happening with the structure, and also all the related to manufacturing and supply for different countries across the world. Thank you for that very elaborate answer. And next up, Gabriel. Hi. Right, so I may, I may have a little different take on this. So um, I think you know our position at Solid, and I'm sure with my pharma colleagues, is that we believe that if this is a compelling therapy, that we should be able to, or we would like to be able to um, per have as many people participate in these in these trials as, as we can across um, as wide a ge geographic area. Very practically, um, we are targeting certain countries because this is where we can really progress the, the therapies the, and the research um, in the most easy and tractable manner. Um, and so for, our, for us, for SOLID, we're certainly um, looking to start in the U.S., and we're, we're, we're definitely engaging with European authorities to um, be able to open up trial sites in Europe and, and other places in the world as we can. But it's really a practical matter of how, how we can move uh, the fastest and most efficiently. Yeah, And maybe also for the people that are listening, the, the companies that are still in the earlier phase, of course, they don't have a plan yet to apply for regulatory approval because well, it's, it's, it's too early. Um, talking about early stage and later stage, so, uh, James, you are next on the on the screen. Of course, Sarepta has already uh, filed for approval with FDA. What about plans for EMA? Uh, what about plans for for China? Well, I think I can I can defer that to Jean Paul and slip sideways around that question as, as Russia responsible for our, our ex US filings. Um, I guess in terms of our selection of countries and and sites, I can kind of echo what everyone has said and and with respect to. to Gabriel and where Solid are at, all of our early trials are done in the US. That's driven partly by the location of the company and partly by the regulatory environment of the US and partly by the availability of high quality um, investigational sites. But we have progressed with Partnership Roche to have sites across Europe, Asia, Australasia, um, largely driven by the experience of the investigators, the quality of the sites and the ability for those sites to recruit patients. Um, I can defer to Jean-Paul to answer the questions around um, uh, approval XUS. And he happens to be next on my screen, so that works out perfectly. Jean-Paul. I think that is also important for the placement of the trials. This, of course, is what Professor Mercury said, having in place a multidisciplinary team. 
uh, in the centers is really important. So that's something which is really very important to consider when sites are selected, regardless in which country. So regarding regulatory approval, as I mentioned in my short presentation, I was maybe rushing through a little bit too fast. Uh, we had uh, we already filed in nine countries who are accepting the FDA dossier, and uh, and so the, the the review of the, of the dossier is ongoing, and we have approval already in EU, uh, UAE and Qatar. Regarding uh, EMA, we are of course uh, already having been in contact with EMA uh, several occasions. We will of course take the totality of the data, including embark and discussed with the uh, European health authorities and uh, UK health authorities, Japanese health authorities, and yeah, you can name it. Um, we have a broad uh, re uh, global reach, and we will discuss, of course, the totality of the data with these health authorities early next year, with the objective, of course, uh, uh, um, to file, if possible, in as many countries as possible. Uh, regarding China, um, we are in general very open to, to conduct studies in China, and we have demonstrated that with our SMA program. And Roche, I was responsible for that uh, for many years. Uh, here for gene therapy, this is a little bit more complex because access is a major challenge today uh, in, 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 in some countries, including China. So we are working uh, to find a solution, but short term, this is, this is difficult. So we hope we find a path forward uh, in China, in other countries, uh, um, which, uh, which of course uh, we know is an urgent need for all patients around the world to get access to this treatment. But it's not as simple as that for gene therapy. Okay, thank you. And finally, sir. So currently we are uh, involved in mainly in Europe, uh, in. Uh, France, UK, uh, Israel is also on the map, and uh, probably other countries. And we are planning uh, to include US for the pivotal trial. Okay, thank you. And then there was a specific question uh, for you, Serge. Uh, quick question, quick answer. When will Genotone start their phase three trial? Uh, hopefully next year. Okay. Good, thank you very much. Um, and the question from the people in the audience are done, but I have one because um, very recently the, the ENMC report on safety uh, monitoring for AAV gene therapy was, was out. And I, I read it today to, to also prepare for this, um, for this webinar. And one of the things that the authors um, call for is a standardized way to monitor the side effects for AAV gene therapy. Um, and is there anything that you want, because so this is a call from the academics, is there anything that any of you would want to say uh, about this? Uh, yeah, maybe I can... Carlos? Okay. Oh, yeah, please go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Yes, related to the most important in, in everything related to clinical trial is the safety of the patients. And then also the close follow-up for the long-term monitoring is also it's, it's so special in terms of the gene therapy, even we're talking about the gene therapy in vivo with AAV. I completely agree. Currently, the different standards is looking for the long-term follow-up at least for 15 years for the case of the AAV, and also ensuring, depending on the program and depending on the gene therapy, how we can get in the acute monitoring during the infusion, then the close monitoring, and then the long-term monitoring. And depending on the gene therapy, we have different kind of visits of the in the structure and institution in order to get a close follow-up for any of the adverse events related to this. And then in the long term, uh, in the end also the AAV gene therapy is uh, inside of the IPSOM. Uh, we expect to have a low, low, low rates of uh, inclusion in the DNA. However, also it's important to see what happened then in the future. The, for the reason, uh, according to the academia and according to the regulatory agency, the long-term follow-up and also the commitment as Pfizer or, or all, all of these sponsors for this clinical trial is to get these kind of conditions in order to get good analysis in order to get the safety of the patients. And then maybe a follow-up question to you and everyone related to this as well. Um, if you see an unexpected safety event, like what was presented by, by Professor Montoni, the anti-microdystrophin, would, would you do then a pre-competitive sharing? And I'm not just asking Carlos, but I'm asking all of you, would you do a pre-competitive sharing given that the, the safety is the most important part? 
given that this is a new approach and we don't know what we don't know. Um, so how how would 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 that be done? How would it work? Um, just... Absolutely, there's no question. I mean, I think yeah. that doc, you know, Dr. Mentoni has really been a leader here in 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 providing a pre-competitive forum for us to be able to speak about our findings here. It's just far too important um, uh, for us to not share. We have to share um, these findings. Yeah. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. And I think we, we already see the benefit of sharing from, from what we heard in the previous session, right? Now now there's awareness uh, and, 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 and people have plans in place uh, to, to monitor these patients. So I, I think that if something new arises uh, on, on our side at Regenx Value, we would definitely share. But uh, we also have to stick to the rules of clinical trials and how you report things to the FDA. So you have to do it, you know, in... Maybe you don't share like the first within the first hour of the thing, but 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 you need you need a you need a few days before you do that. So there is a procedure for that, but we yeah. would definitely share. Yeah, well, I'm 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 glad to hear it, and I'm sure everyone else was also glad to hear it. And I saw people nodding, and I saw people wanting to 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 react more. But sadly, we have reached the end of this panel discussion. Um, so I'm going to hand over back to uh, Elizabeth and Susie Ann for the final part of this um, this webinar. Thank you so much, uh, Annemiek, and thank you, everybody from the companies who did, uh, and Genesome is not a company as such, but you know what I mean. Thank you so much for all the speakers who were just uh, here in this panel. Thank you also for the work you are doing. And then now, um, not so long ago, I, I spoke to Mencia, Mencia de Lemos Belmonte from the Spanish uh, SMA uh, group, or she's a Spanish representative in the European SMA group. And she said, okay, and then there's an approval. And then do you know what you're facing then? You could learn from us. So this is the um, really uh, good moment to hear from her what the SMA community ran into and what they've learned after there was an approval. So uh, Mencia, welcome, the floor is yours. Okay, so uh, thank you so much. I'm I'm conscious that I am the last one uh, for the, uh, from this long webinar. So I'll try to make it short, but uh, it is true what um, Elizabeth was saying. We did have the discussion on why don't you have a look on what's happening to diseases that have gone through a similar situation you will be hopefully facing in a, in a near future so that you take lessons and you can learn from our experience and you can uh, maybe uh, address the hurdles that we have already addressed in a better way, in a more smooth and efficient way. So um, spinal muscular atrophy has its own, oh, sorry, this is my disclosure. Um, Spinal muscular atrophy, which is SMA, it, it has also a gene therapy. It's called Solgensma. It was approved some years ago. And so with this presentation, I will explain very little about the disease so that you understand then the problems that I will explain further on and see if you can find some similarities and you can uh, address them before they, they even come. So SMA is a progressive neuromuscular disease. It is uh, caused by uh, an absence of one gene, a short gene. Uh, and um, the people that live with SMA do not have this gene and they have another gene that can be expressed in one copy or several copies. This other, this second gene, which is the SMN2, uh, does not produce a stable protein all the time. In fact, 90% of the time it produces it in an unstable, unstable way, but it does produce a little bit of protein. So uh, this makes that people live, living with SMA do survive, but uh, they have a severe disease that has a clinical manifestation of muscle weakness. So the muscles that are affected in SMA are those related to movement, voluntary movement. So we don't have the heart or the diaphragma affected, but we do have the neck, arms, legs, hands, trunk affected. People living with SMA also have different manifestations. And we frequently say that although we are divided into types, this classification was done artificially by doctors back in the pre-treatment era to be able to, well, to share and to study uh, the different evolutions of the disease. But 
as it is an spectrum disease, um, there are forms that are some in between slope. So we have the most severe form that unfortunately do not survive past two years of age. Uh, we also have the um, mid form, which is the type two. This is children that can sit independently, but can never walk. And here we have the range people that can sit, people that can or could stand and people that could maybe walk with orthosis but could not walk independently. So it's a very big range there. Type threes cover the people that were able to walk, but some of them uh, can preserve that function from, for several years, whereas others uh, can only walk for several months. And then, and then the disease starts manifesting and they lose that function. And finally, type fours are a very um, exceptional lucky ones that start having symptoms past second a decade of their life. Since 20, well, 2017 is like the year the, that uh, life changed for people living with SMA. We had the first drug approved. On 2020, we had the gene therapy approved. And then on 2021, we had the oral therapy approved. Now, we have three disease-modifying therapies all three of them address the underlying cause of the disease. We cannot say today if there is one that's better, that's more efficacious or more safe than the others. We can't say even if there's one that works better for a certain group of people or for a certain group of muscles or for a certain function. We still don't know anything about that. But we have three alternatives, which is excellent. And uh, you can also read uh, the uh, uh, label that we received in Europe. So spin Raza received a broad label for all people living with SMA. Gene therapy received a much broader label than we thought in Europe, which is for type 1's SMA or for people having up, up, of, up to three SMN2 copies. Um, and then the oral therapies for types 1, 2, and 3 with uh, from 1 to 4 SMN2 copies. So I'm going to concentrate on the gene therapy and what happened after its approval. So as I say, it was much broader than what we expected because there was no limitations regarding age or regarding weight, for instance, whereas clinical trials had been concentrated on a certain uh, ages and, and weight. So... The first reaction that came were uh, expert doctors uh, uh, on SMA uh, published a consensus in which they contained, it was a consensus, but it, it, it could be used as guidelines for treating with gene therapy patients uh, with SMA. Um, they established in it, well, what evidence there was, what precautions there had to be, what follow-ups, uh, and so on. And so uh, that was published, and this, a second reaction came, which was the patient reaction. Our patient group, SMA Europe, published a letter reacting to the uh, doctor's consensus, uh, saying that we very much supported it, basically. Uh, there was one statement with which we were a bit worried, which was the uh, use of the number of SMN2 copies as a biomarker, because although it, it is a good predictor, it is not perfect. So there is people with very severe forms of the disease that have three, four SMN2 copy numbers, whereas, uh, and then, well, there can be a, a milder forms that have less copy numbers. So if you take it as a solid biomarker, you might be missing very severe uh, people from, from treatment. And uh, But our main concern was basically that these guidelines, instead of being used or, or in addition to being used by doctors to treat their patients, they would be used by HTAs and reimbursement authorities on their negotiations uh, for, for uh, reimbursing Zolgensma. And, uh, and then thirdly, um, reaction of the company, I put it a bit cynically, they set up a $2 million uh, price per dose, and then they established a lottery in which they gave out some free doses for some patients per year, which led to a very horrible situation, a very emotionally hard to cope with situation with the families that were desperate for receiving this gene therapy that, as I say, it has not yet 
not yet been proved as more efficacious as, um, as the rest of the therapies available. So um, effectively, uh, reimbursement authorities did use these guidelines to restrict access to uh, gene therapy. And so what we did as a patient group was uh, strongly advocate uh, and try to educate and try to get involved in these discussions so that uh, the decisions would be left on the treating doctors and the expert doctors' hands as much as possible. So, for instance, uh, one of the restrictions that was applied by the authorities was related to types. So, types two and, and three were frequently excluded. On the EMA label, they were not specifically excluded because if you had up to three SMN2 copies, it was okay, but not for the reimbursement authorities. So I use this picture to um, advocate and I frequently ask the question from these two kids, one has SMA type two, the other one has SMA type three, would you be able to tell who has SMA type two or SMA type three? Well, the boy on the left-hand side, Nico, has SMA type two. It's very hard to tell. Um, another restriction was related to type. So uh, in many countries, they would only reimburse um, either presymptomatic or children with type 1 SMA because they thought that presymptomatic, obviously, it, uh, the drug would be more efficacious and type 1s uh, were living uh, the most severe condition. So again, with this picture, I can illustrate um, these three girls. Um, had a type 2 SMA, all three of them. The one on the right-hand side, she is getting a gastrostomy uh, very soon because she's unable to, to chew by herself. The girl with the two ponytails on the left-hand side sadly passed away um, two years ago. Uh, she, uh, well, she, she did have treatment, but she was too weak to, to, to survive anyway. Uh, with this, what I want to say is that because there is such a severe form of SMA, the other forms are frequently seen or described as milder forms, but it is a bit of a joke to say that any of the children that I have just shown you in the pictures, none of them are type ones, uh, have mild forms of SMA. And um, it is also true that presymptomatic children or younger children will uh, be able to show the highest efficacy but also it is very important to show that in a progressive disease such as SMA or DMD, stabilization is a great gain, is a really game changer and a life changer for people that are living with a disease such as ours. Therefore, um, of course, uh, if you can save the life of someone that would not survive beyond two years of age and you can even make them walk when they would not even be able to breathe by themselves that's a great gain but that 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 does not mean that the gains that are changing and are improving the quality of life and i mean they're really they're really changing the lives of the rest of the patients are not important other restrictions were also related to age and weight whether they had received previous treatments on and whether they were on invasive ventilation as uh, frequently for SMA in um, reimbursement or regulate, uh, regulatory bodies assimilate invasive uh, ventilation to death. Now, this girl, she's a weak type, type 1. She is on, on therapy. She didn't receive gene therapy, but she has been on therapy for several years. This girl could not even sit she could, of course, not move her arms as she's moving. The expression on, on her face, she struggled to speak. Now I have seen videos of, of uh, Bath swimming in the swimming pool connected to her ventilator. Her life has completely changed. She, she's attending a school. So honestly, how can somebody say that, uh, that this girl was not worth treating? She was absolutely worth treating and... and and every year that we see her at the uh, family gatherings in Spain, we're so happy to see how well she's doing. So, uh, of course, there were many restrictions related to the SMN2 copies. 
The way we did to advocate for this was with our own registry. Now, these are numbers from the Spanish uh, SMA registry, which is led by patients. There is also another registry that's led by clinicians and we collaborate with them. But from our registry, if you look at the SMN2 copy numbers and the SMA type that you have, you see that with four SMN2 copy numbers, you have six SMA type two children and you have 24 SMA type three. With three SMN2 copy numbers, you have 11 type ones, 103 type twos, which is normal, but also 52 type threes and so on. So with this, we try to make the case that the SMN2 copy number is not a perfect biomarker and, um, and therefore uh, reimbursement decisions or, uh, or treatment decisions should not be that hardly based on this because you would be skipping very important lives too. Mencia, could you round off a little bit? Because okay, uh, you're okay yeah. yes, thank you. So I'm almost finished. Yes, yeah. so this is a map that shows green full access. And these are just some examples of um, the creativeness of our reimbursement authorities. And uh, uh, yes, and the negotiations. Another important thing that I wanted to say to you is uh, it is great uh, that there are shared results uh, schemes, but uh, with which milestones? I really think that patients and experts should be consulted when negotiating these types of things. Um, conclusions, really get involved as much as possible, advocate as much as possible, and start gathering data that is fit for purpose for regulatory and reimbursement decisions, and above all, that's patient relevant, so that it's capturing what you really think is important about your disease and about the impact of treatments on your disease. And good luck. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, thank you so much, Mencia. Thank you so much. There, there's one question which immediately comes to mind, and that is if you have uh, discussed also as patient community, maybe ahead of all this to the H with the HCA people or the regulators, what they would accept as uh, patient relevant data. Did that discussion take place? I know we are in that field together, but just to call <laughs> the others. Yeah. So HTAs and reimbursements uh, are discussions that take place nationally. And in yeah. each country, there is a very different relation and a very uh, different way that we are involved or not involved. So um, I think that it's coming from the regulator's hand, but gradually the HTAs are starting to hear more and more about patient relevant data, about patient um, data captured by patients. But uh, there is, I mean, we're still a bit far, far away from there, unfortunately. Thank yeah. Thank you so much. And then I see, I will see if there are questions in the chat to you. Suzanne, do you see? No, I don't think so, right? There are no specific questions for Mencia in the question and answer session. You had a question yourself, which I will forward to Annemiek, I promised. And uh, with this, I really would like to thank you uh, that you took the time to kind of tell us like an older sister, you know, not really older, but like advanced in the procedure, what, what kind of troubles you have ran into or ch challenges, whatever you want to call it. I would really love to thank everybody who was here today. I see a lot of people are still online, the participants, the companies, the clinicians. Uh, Annemiek is gone and she had to leave, she said. Uh, Suzanne for setting this up. And I hope we will have more fruitful webinars in the, in the times to come about this. And again, thank you so much for everybody who's working in this field. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, everybody.